Okay. I hereby call the October 21st, 2020 meeting of the Cohasset School Committee to order. Would all members who are present please indicate so when your name is called. Mrs. Kaliri. Present. Mr. Kearney. Present. Mrs. Marr. Present. Mrs. St. Ange. Present. Present. Craig McClellan. All members are present. Uh, as I state at the outset of every meeting, um, this otherwise in-person public meeting is being held virtually following Governor Baker's declaration of a state of emergency in this Commonwealth. It is, however, being streamed live on Facebook as well as Cohasset 143 TV. Uh, with that said, moving on to the um, first agenda item is public comment. Again, this uh, section of the agenda is reserved for uh, members of the public to uh, make comment or raise points of discussion related to uh, any issues that are not already uh, noted on the agenda. So if there's any agenda items, um, please wait until we reach that point in the meeting to comment. I'll give a few seconds here for um, attendees to chime in. <clears throat> Okay, seeing none, moving on to the next agenda item, which brings us to the superintendent's report. I turn the meeting over to our superintendent of schools, Dr. Patrick Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Chairman McClellan, and thank you all for, for being here. And um, I am very happy to start off the meeting by uh, acknowledging some of what we would call our unsung heroes in our school district. I'm gonna just take a second and I'm gonna promote Marilyn Harridan, our Director of Food Services, and uh, Michelle Parfumors, Missy, who is our um, Supervisor of Transportation. So just give me a moment and I'm going to promote them to panelists. They are coming in. Give them a second for their technology to click in. Uh, Bob Tusher, who is our head custodian, was also going to be here. I know he was running into some um, personal uh, commitments that were maybe delaying him a little bit. There's Marilyn. Hello, Marilyn. Hi. How are you? Good, and you? I'm doing great, thanks. And Missy, I don't know if you're in there yet. Missy is muted. Oh, there she is, awesome. Hello, Missy, can you hear us? Hello, yes, thank you. Wonderful. So. I'm obviously very excited to have Missy and Marilyn here. Um, they do amazing work along with their teams, as does uh, Bob Tusher and his custodians. And we thought we'd take the time. And I believe Chris, is that Chris behind Missy there? <laughs> that is. Hello, Chris. Uh, Chris is our, our bus mechanic, does a fabulous job for us. And uh, I thought I'd take a moment to acknowledge our, uh, our these three great groups. And I know our school committee wants to say some words, but. I have a little um, presentation here. It's very short, but hopefully, let's see. There we go. You all see the presentation? Nope. No, no. Can't see it, oh, that's great. <laughs> There you go. Now. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Good. Second time's a charm. So anyway, just a couple of pictures in the background. I wasn't able to capture uh, everyone here. I thought we'd just start off saying some words about our amazing bus drivers. This is some of the crew from last year. Um, our bus drivers are always at the heart of everything we do. Obviously, they get the kids to school. And without getting the kids to school, we can't, we can't really do much. Um, but this year in particular, they've uh, been an amazing team planning through a, uh, a very difficult set of circumstances uh, to create two separate bus routes for um, each, uh, both the elementary and the, the middle school. So it's been a real challenge to uh, create those routes. And then of course, all the safety precautions that they've had to go through, learning all the cleaning protocols, creating safe environments for our kids where they have all the seats marked, where the kids can seat safely, sit safely, um, making sure this, the kids feel comfortable. I've said many times our bus drivers are the, they're the first people that our kids see. You know, a new kindergarten student getting on the bus, that's his first um, in, or her first interaction with our, our, ed, our educators and, and school. 
So to do all of those safety measures uh, and then to be able to still provide that really warm, engaging uh, op, uh, experience for our students is just, it's so commendable. And uh, I gotta tell you, I'm incredibly impressed by their flexibility, their ability to problem solve, um, the way they communicate with each other to keep each other in the loop on what's happening during the day. Uh, last year, if you remember, we had that storm, it was kind of a rogue um, windstorm. And we had one day where we, we couldn't come back because there was too much going on. And then there was the second day when on the fly, we said we thought we could do it, but we had trees come down. We had all kinds of uh, problems and to watch them problem solve and change their roots and communicate with each other. I knew I was uh, really surrounded by a, a group of professionals who we're going to do everything they could uh, to make the make the uh, students come first. Uh, and this year, without exception, they continued that. Even before we started school, this is just an image of them creating those uh, safe spots that students can stand at our bus stops. Very impressive. I, don't, I do not know many towns that have done this ar uh, around us. Thank you for the town for allowing us to do this. But we found it very important. You know, the bus stop is a part of our school day. It's a part of our school. Um, and to make sure that their students are safely uh, lining up with that separation was really important. So I, I can't say enough about our bus drivers, everything they do for our, our, our kids, mm -hmm. and everything they provide for us. And there's uh, you know, certainly challenges ahead of us, but I feel really lucky to have such a great crew uh, working with us. Uh, move on to our custodians, and I know we'll go back and kind of acknowledge all of them, but I, I couldn't get images of all of our custodians. Mm -hmm. Here's our middle and high school crew. And um, Dr. Scollins, if you could kind of monitor our, um, uh, our panelists, I mean, I should say our attendees, to see if uh, Bob might be showing up, that'd be great. And if he does, just you know, have him promote him up uh, forward. But our, our custodians are amazing. Uh, they too had a lot to, uh, to do to prepare for the coming school year. And you've seen images of their, their labors, uh, getting the schools, first of all, cleaned out of excess furniture, an incredibly difficult task. Uh, to get our, our rooms basically totally taken apart and put back <clears> together. <throat> Not to mention all the work that they do typically to clean our, our buildings, to get them spick and span, and then to put up all the signage that came our way uh, to make sure that our, our students are following the proper social distancing protocols and um, to put up, work closely with our facilities, to put up all of our hand sanitizer, to get all of that furniture into trailers. Um, <clears throat> You know, and then to, to create a whole new and really create and collaborate with us to create a whole new set of cleaning protocols, both touch point cleaning and deep cleaning. And, you know, I just was, um, I heard some noise here and I realized they're deep cleaning our uh, central office, which is wonderful. So you can see uh, all of these, these incredible uh, labors in action. And here you have just a couple of examples of, you know, getting ready, regular maintenance on the right, Painting, our, painting some of our, our walls and not so regular maintenance on our left, which is uh, Bob Tuscher is our head custodian with, that's an electromagnetic spray uh, gun, which they, they use to help clean some of the, the high touch areas. And it also assists in um, our deep cleaning. Here's Devin, who I knew Devin as a student. Uh, he, was, he was actually a student of mine in a previous district. And to have Devin with us is great, but just showing that you know they're 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 constantly moving, constantly cleaning, and really are, are just such a great and uh, amazing part of our school. And then we move on to our uh, food service workers. And again, I could not um, I, I could not find pictures of all of them. I realize I have to take possibly more pictures of your crew. Marilyn to do them justice. They probably wouldn't like that, but uh, probably uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> but we did capture uh, a few of them uh, recently uh, doing some work. This is at Deer Hill where they're delivering um, snacks and, uh, and food. And they too had an amazing task ahead of them. I, I should say kudos to Marilyn and her team. I, I, I've mentioned this in public, but while I have her here, 
the work her team did during the beginning of the pandemic, where remember, we never stopped providing food. We were one of the only districts, I think, that have provided food throughout the summer as well. Uh, and we were able to not only feed um, folks in our, in our school community who needed, needed the food, but we were able to work closely with our, um, our seniors and our senior citizens uh, to work with, uh, um, is it Nancy in our senior center? Nancy, yes. Nancy, to make sure that our, um, our seniors were fed uh, throughout some of the tough times, real community effort. And uh, that, was, that was a wonderful thing. And they also, just like the bus drivers and the custodians had to uh, turn quickly, uh, create a whole new set of um, serving protocols, cleaning protocols, um, ways to find out what people want for food. We, we've in, implemented a online system, which I know folks who are watching have seen in my, my, my latest uh, newsletters for, um, for families to be able to place orders ahead of time. And they've just gone above and beyond to make sure that our, our students are fed, that uh, we're providing, I did catch this quick uh, glimpse of some of them in, in uh, action here, Marilyn. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, obviously making sure that the food, this is pre-pandemic, but that our foods are healthy, nutritious um, and, um, and delicious. So thank you so much, Marilyn and your team. And I just wanted to uh, thank these three groups and hopefully we'll be able to acknowledge some more folks later, but I know the school committee wanted to say a few words in regards to the, the heroic actions uh, that are every day. And the everyday heroes are the real heroes, right? They're the ones that do the work. It's not, not necessarily uh, do they get the credit that they deserve, but um, I thought tonight would be a good night to, to acknowledge them. So thank you for school committee for coming up with the idea and for for doing this. So um, I'll leave it to you, school committee, for comments. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Sullivan. Uh, <clears throat> any members of the uh, committee? I know one member that will, will always loves to thank people. We'll, we'll probably have something to say, but does uh, any members of the school committee have something to say? Something to add? I know that so much work has gone into this all summer and, you know, all of us are working hard, <laughs> but uh, we're sort of, you know, reporting on our progress to the community directly regularly and we're grateful to have this opportunity to note all of your hard work over these last few months that have been so challenging we're so grateful so thank you all thank you, thank you mr Caleri. anyone else i'd love to just say thank you and i um i'm thrilled to be seeing your help and support through my children's eyes who are at osgood and deer hill and take the bus and eat school lunch every day that they're there so we are really taking advantage <laughs> of the, whole, the whole package here at Shea St. Ange. But um, as far as my kids are concerned, you guys are like fairies. They're like, lunch? It just arrived. I got my own desk and my lunch was just there. And like <laughs> the bus, it was perfect. It's so quick this year. So in, in through the eyes of my kiddos, like everything is perfect and seamless. And it has just really eased a lot of anxiety about re-entry to school. So I think without the you know, they feel safe and clean and well taken care of. And it's, it's thanks a lot to, to all of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. St. Orange. Mrs. Mrs. Marr. Um, I'll echo the thanks of everybody and I'll just share. I don't have kids in the school that ride the bus or eat the food, but I was on my way to work one morning a week or so ago and it was still dark. And I looked ahead on Route 3 North, right? near Braintree and I saw a school bus. And I said, I wonder if that's a Cohasset bus going to pick up the Metco kids. And as I went by it at the proper speed limit, it did say <laughs> Cohasset on the side. And I think it's just amazing that, and I don't know, Dr. Sullivan, if any other districts are doing this that, that have, have rooted their own buses to make sure that our students from Boston are included you know, in our school community every day that we're in school um, and have worked it out so that the children that we need to, to transport from within town are transported. And um, thank you to whomever is the school bus driver who does that, that trip a couple of times a day. And um, it benefits everybody when all of our students can be in school. So thank you. 
Yeah, we, we also are, are there working hard to make sure that uh, students who need um, to stay after for sports are getting transport too. Uh, that was a, a monumental effort uh, as we tried to figure out how to, to best do that with all the, the schedules and the learning happening at home. And um, we, I would say the same with, with Marilyn. Is there, everybody is problem solving and it's really impressive to see uh, Marilyn, Missy, Bob, lead their teams, um, you know, working, all of them working really closely with Sue Owen, our director of uh, finance and operations, but to watch those, those teams work is really impressive because I, every day is something challenging. I gotta tell you with, with all of those groups, they're, they're, they're dealing with things that are new um, that we couldn't really have thought of if we, even if we tried to, and they're, they're doing a great job problem solving. So. Can't can't agree with you more there, um, Alan. So just to uh, just to chime in, I, I wanted to you know sort of recognize each group. It, I'm really happy that that you did this, Dr. Sullivan. It's so important that the community realizes um, how much um, these three groups have contributed to the very difficult task of getting our kids back to school in today's world. Um, you know, the bus drivers, uh, you know, it goes from the little things to, you know, I, I too was, was, uh, was uh, on the road uh, near a Cohasset bus the other day and, um, you know, just, just got thinking, you know, uh, about all the, the training involved in ensuring that the drivers are following all the safety rules and regulations in the road. And, you know, there's such precious cargo on there and they just do such a fantastic job. I was just following one and seeing how they sort of, you know, ensured all the kids were like, you know, all the little ones were like in the mother's arms before they even closed the door and made the stop sign go away. And, um, you know, to, to stopping at the railroad crossings, which is something you could easily blow through as something that, you know, you do in a passenger vehicle. And, you know, I know it, it seems like crazy to, to say, but, you know, it, it, you know, this is this, this is the product of training and they see that and they stop and they know that, you know, it's just, it's just another example of the, the many, many things that they have to be thinking of constantly when they're driving around a vehicle filled with other people's children. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, selfless task. And, you know, at times I think thankless and it's, it's important that, that everyone's uh, recognizing them, you know, to the big things that they do, like, you know, going out and, and making those bus stops. I mean, that's something that's going the extra mile and it just shows the, the extra dedication. It was just so wonderful to see. And there are many, um, just so you know, there are there are many members of the community that were just so impressed by the extra level of care there. And, uh, you know, it's also kind of cute to see the little school buses on the streets, uh, you know, as you drive around, sort of a reminder that, <clears throat> you know, we are back in school. And uh, yeah, I think everyone likes to see that as far as the uh, food service employees go. Um, I, uh, in my capacity as a school committee member, uh, have done a number of walkthroughs um, to, 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 to review the operations of the school during this new learning model. And one of the major things, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, major challenges was lunch service. And as we all know, we didn't immediately start with that. It was until the second, you know, sort of week that we started the lunch service program. And uh, I think there was a lot of anxiety surrounding that. And it was just handled with such grace and such, you know, professionalism. And, you uh, it was just, there was not even a hitch. And, and you see all of the, it's a completely different system for the food and serv food service employees. And they have absolutely no problem adapting. They're happy to do it. They're uh, very happily hustling the meals out to the kids uh, in their bags, prepackaging them, uh, making sure everyone's safe and happy and fed. And they do it with a smile on their face and absolutely zero complaints. And, uh, and, and it's just so wonderful to see. So thank you so much. And, and as far as the custodians go, I will say that I have been in the school, uh, the schools, uh, it, it, whether it's in my capacity as a parent or, or as a school committee member, a lot. And every single time I'm there, I, 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 I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Every single time I'm there, I see a custodian working, whether it's during hours, before hours, after hours, that, that staff works tirelessly, especially in connection with getting uh, the facilities up and running for this uh, very, very uh, particular and unique learning model. And they are very, they, they're absolutely, um, they, are, they are to be commended for that. Um, to all the groups collectively, the, um, the remarkable level of cooperation you have all showed 
um, is very illustrative of and demonstr demonstrative of your uh, your just your overall dedication and care and kindness and generosity um, and just enthusiasm for our overall mission uh, as a district and your dedication to our district's children. So thank you all so much. Yeah, uh, uh, Craig, I just want to reiterate, no one can see me. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to get through this. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to echo what uh, Craig said. I, when I think of you guys, it, it, it's just heroes is a good word, Dr. Sullivan. And thank you for bringing that to our attention because it is a team, of, it's a team approach. And I think that what I like to see is everybody is improving. I, mean, I feel like we're all improving every day as a team. And you see that with the custodians, like you said, Craig, you know, I, I coach basketball and you, you go in there at 6, 6, 30, 7, 30, there's someone in there. There's always someone cleaning and working and, you know, participating and with a smile on their face. And um, you, you see that with the, uh, the school bus, uh, my, my children, it's, it's the fun part of their day. You know, they're, they've been able to uh, play soccer again and they, they get to go on the school bus. They love it, you know, and um and as far as the, the, the food service goes, absolutely great people serving food to our children. And we're so blessed and we're so thankful for all the folks that, uh, that are here tonight and, and, and the folks that aren't here that are actually cleaning our schools right now. So uh, God bless them all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Missy and Marilyn. I should mention, um, uh, you know, we focus a lot on lunch, but uh, Maryland team are also doing a fabulous job with breakfast this True. year. Um, and they have in other years, but it's, uh, you know, just that's an important factor. They're, and they're also working uh, closely with our teams with, with snacks and, um, you know, it's, it's full service for, for all these groups. So um, I don't know if anyone else has any any comments or thoughts. Uh, Bob uh, Tusher may jump in at some point and we'll, we'll let him come in. I don't know. He's I know he's trying to trying to come in, but um, I, he's not not successfully doing it. So um, anyway, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. If not, I'll let Missy and Marilyn get ready for tomorrow. I and, just want to, and, I just and want to I, say thank you so much. You can watch them all summer long. It was amazing. And I should say thank you to Chris, uh, who I know is back there. Is uh, the buses don't work unless he's working. So thank you, Chris, keeping the buses going. Can I, um, can I add something? Um, I needed a, to say a thank you to my bus drivers, but also to the, the Laird family for doing the routes for us this year. They were phenomenal. And Lisa Tokars, she is the secretary that coordinates all the bus passes and, uh, you know, communicates to all the schools. So she's a big part of this transportation system and she needs a kudos too. Absolutely. Yeah, and the Lairds are um, some uh, folks that you know, speak of unsung heroes that definitely need a shout out from us because of the work they did this summer. Totally selfless. Yeah, and Lisa, it, it doesn't happen without Lisa either. So absolutely. Thank you, Missy. I just want to add one thing. I want to, I want to thank them all. Um, they've been wonderful. They've been so accommodating. I mean, we've We've worked so well together as a team. We probably speak almost on a daily basis, either via text message or um, I walk, you know, I walk downstairs or Missy comes in to see me. And, and same thing with Bob. It's it's almost a daily routine, but they've been so accommodating and so flexible. And they've been put under the gun and they've jumped through every hoop that we've put up and they haven't stumbled and they got the job done endlessly well. Um, and it, it shows by the walkthroughs that we did, watching the classrooms and watch, watching the kids come in in the morning, um, watching them have lunch. Um, it's been really, it's been really um, exciting to see all the work finally comes together. It's like, the, it's like the final performance after all the work. So thank you guys, it's been great. You've been wonderful. Thank you. So well, again, thank you, Missy and Marilyn. Um, and so I'll say thank you to my staff as well. And honestly, it's been a team effort the whole time. Everybody from IT to town facilities to the elderly services, principals, everyone has just joined in as a team. And, you know, like Sue said, everybody's just been really positive with trying to just do the best we can and, you know, get the job done and get the kids back in. And I think we're doing it and it's, you know, it's working and we're, we're getting in our routine now. So we're, 
we're uh, making it happen. Wonderful. Okay, yeah, my bus well, drivers were fantastic as far as being flexible and learning all the new procedures and so forth. So huge kudos to them also. Absolutely agreed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Missy. And thank you, uh, Marilyn. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I'll, I'll let you sign off and get ready for tomorrow. All see you, right. see you, you in the morning. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, and thank you again, school committee, for, for doing that. That was that was important and, and very nice. Um, should I move on, um, Chairman McClellan? Please. Okay, so next we have our student representative, uh, Caroline Patterson, who is um, coming up on her senior night for uh, soccer. I think it's uh, tomorrow evening. And uh, it, we're excited to hear an update on how things are progressing. and. Um, I will leave it to Caroline to to um, give us uh, the scoop on how things are going. Caroline Patterson. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'll just start off by kind of like talking about how academics have been going for me. I know that in the past week or so, teachers have been more trying to get our feedback by like get putting surveys out about the workload because not only for us that we are kind of in this new way of learning, but they're also in a new way of teaching and a lot of their lesson plans that they've been relying on for many, many years are um, obviously gonna look different now. And I know you had kind of asked for like, not really a criticism, but something that I have kind of observed is that sometimes the technology does get a little tedious um, just in the ways that like teachers definitely um, use like Google Classroom and stuff to their advantage, but most of the work is kind of done through paper and pen and notebooks and stuff like that. But when it comes time to upload, uploading like 20, like 15 to 20 pages of like math or to econ um, through Google Classroom is a little, <laughs> it just can get frustrating sometimes, um, especially if you're trying to meet a deadline. I know in tests, um, when the clock's ticking down and you're struggling to find a way to get a picture from your phone into the website of the test, that can be a little frustrating for some students, but teachers have been obviously understanding of that and accommodating. And also kind of in the past week, if a student had to be home for a certain reason during their regular on-person days, so I'm in cohort B, so I have seen some cohort a people kind of pop in on the Zooms, normally when they be in class, but teachers recognize that and they're been very accommodating. And then um, even coach, like my coaches and Mr. Rotundi have like kind of in the past week too, even more just stressing the importance of social distancing and being more conscious of contact tracing, which is important as kind of things will pop up, but it's, our job to be responsible and respectful um, to all of our students and to everyone around us and our peers and do the best we can to make it so everyone can keep doing the things like going to school and playing sports that they all want to do. Um, that's pretty much it, unless I know anyone had kind of specific questions because the weeks do go by pretty fast. Um, from what I'm realizing, just because now it, it's Wednesday, I'm transitioning to going into school today and tomorrow and um, student council have, they've done good, great initiatives. Like we do have kind of a spirit week that became a spirit month. Um, so kids get to dress up on the Tuesdays and the Fridays, which have been fun for high schoolers just because it's kind of that thing, especially being a senior, the last kind of time and um wearing pink for breast cancer awareness on wednesdays a couple you can see kids in the zooms doing that so just a lot of kind of things that make it feel like it's normal but you can still do it from home which has been good thank you thank you caroline i know there's a lot um and, and I, we appreciate that we we are as um folks know in the process of really 
uh, dipsticking and getting a sense for where we are uh, with our new model in, in every way. We have some students that we're um, going to do some focus groups with on Friday, I believe, Dr. Scollins. Um, yes. Yes, to, to get a sense. Uh, we have a survey out to families. Um, we're working with the CTA to get a um, survey out to staff. So that feedback's important. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of adjustments. There are many adjustments happening as um, teachers decide which is the best format to uh, collect work. Uh, obviously, online assessments are something that are rather new. So creating those meaningful online assessments. So it'll be interesting to see your views as we go on uh, and go forward with this and, and get better at what we're doing uh, as well. So thank you for that that uh, that thought. That was that was important. Yeah, and just um, more kind of for Dr. Sullivan, I'm sure as we kind of meet with Jake and Jenna and um, kind of the rest, I'm sure across the grade levels, everyone has is going to have a lot to say. So excited about that. And I think everyone's kind of ready to kind of outpour some ideas in a kind of environment more conducive for just like student collaboration. So yeah. Yes. And you'll be hearing from me this week on that, by the way, just so you know, in case you guys start to talk about where, where is it? Where is it? It's coming. <laughs> All right, that's great. Any uh, questions or thoughts from the, the team? Uh, Caroline, I just want to, uh, as you know, this is uh, for me, one of the more interesting parts of every meeting. So uh, especially, you know, these days, I'm just kind of trying to get a sense of uh, what is your, uh, what is your understanding in terms of like the, the overall spirit or morale of the student body? I mean, does everyone seem to be in good spirits when they're in school, when they're, you know, when you see everyone, how's everyone doing? Yeah, um, definitely in school, definitely it's like everyone's kind of appreciative to be there. I know we've been really fortunate to have like nice weather, even kind of this late into October, which in New England we're not really used to, and I'm sure it's going to turn the tide rather quickly. But being like in the mask breaks and even during lunch, just being able to kind of get outside, take your mask off, and just kind of um, – have a nice break from just kind of a lot. It's definitely nice. So definitely students have been taking advantage of that and kind of being able to spread out amongst the building. And at home, it's like, it's just different because a lot of the students who you would normally like communicate with about classwork and homework and stuff like that, if they're in a different cohort, it's like a little bit different. The material is still the same, but it's just flip flop. So definitely students have been kind of finding new people, which is great because then we're collaborating with different people from different grade levels and stuff like that, that you're not normally used to, which kind of pushes for that. So that's a positive that I think I've seen. And a lot of teachers have been pushing that more because even if you can't on a Monday or Tuesday, go see your teacher to talk about it, like a lot of the kids are definitely having the same questions. So using each other as resources is definitely really that's good that's awesome once once again an example of the uh, seniors finding the uh the silver lining here in all of this thanks caroline yeah thank you so if there are no more questions caroline caroline you could maybe stay on for the superintendent's report and then i'll i know you got probably remote assignments to do uh -huh. right? yeah <laughs> but no, definitely i'll listen so thank you okay wonderful uh, thank you caroline so a couple of uh, other update points. Um, obviously, the community knows, the school community knows we had our um, first two uh, positive cases in our school community. And um, we worked uh, to be as transparent as we can be with our uh, information. I, one thing I want to stress, and that I, I spoke with our nurses today, um, or our, our head nurse today, uh, regarding um, the really the importance and um, duty that you know people have to communicate to us when uh, there are situations and um, you know that these this particular these particular situations that that happened and we're so thankful that happened because it helps us uh, contact those um, really uh, close contacts and there there happened to have been none in the school buildings uh, with these uh, particular cases but to uh, to be able to uh, contact who might be a 
a close contact. And then obviously to have those folks quarantined and we work very closely with our, with our Department of Public Health when we do so. But I just wanna assert the, the importance of making sure that um, people do contact us, people do communicate with us. And that when we do go through the contact tracing process that they're really open with us about folks um, who may be close contacts. And when I say us, I'm really talking our Department of Public Health, our head nurse, uh, who are really doing the, the contact tracing. But I just wanted to say that. And also um, about our, uh, our sports and the way things are going with our, with our sports are going very well. Uh, we have uh, a lot of social distancing protocols and uh, a good amount of them in place where we're following all the regulations and guidelines. I check in regularly with Athletic Director Rotundi, Principal Scott regarding those. Uh, we just met yesterday. Uh, we're constantly talking as a league with the superintendents and with our ADs and principals about what we're allowing for our, our crowds. I, I should say crowd might be the wrong word, our, our, uh, our spectators, people who are, are coming to our events. And I know that, uh, that um, uh, Athletic Director Rotundi sent out a note. I just want to read some of the regulations and provisions for spectators. Uh, keep in mind that we are working with our Department of Public Health, making sure that our, our venues have no more than 100 folks in them, um, and that we're looking for two spectators per player. Uh, if we have to reduce to 50, right now we're at 100, but when we have our, um, our spectators coming in, and this goes for us as well, we're going other places, uh, only home spectators are allowed to attend events. So we're telling people not to, not to um, travel to other athletic contests. Uh, all spectators when entering a facility must use their cell phone to scan in the home events QR code. Uh, all spectators must wear a face covering at all times. All spectators must practice social distancing at a minimum of six feet uh, from others. We have been allowing folks because they're not in to be along the fence. And we're really looking for people to make sure that and I'm talking about here at alumni, but to make sure that they have those six feet in between them. We do have folks walking around, making sure and reminding folks to do that, but your assistance is really appreciated. At the conclusion of games, we're asking for folks not to congregate, to wait for the athletes. Um, and then we are, we are streaming all of our home games through the NFHS network. So that's important to remember for folks who wanna watch from home. And uh, there, there are not emission, there, there are no emission charges for uh, CHS home events uh, this year. So those are just some important things I wanted to mention that I think are, are really important safety uh, thoughts. And I know we'll talk more about Halloween coming up uh, and uh, some of the committee's thoughts around Halloween. But you know, as you heard me say last time, that's that's an event that does trouble me and worry me. Uh, not that I'm anti-Halloween. I have four kids and. You know, we're, we, we certainly have celebrated that uh, heartily throughout the, the years that they've been able to do that, but this is not a year for that. This is a year for alternative um, events. We have one such event at our Osgood um, on, uh, let's see, I believe it's October 28th, where it's uh, a spin on our traditional trunk or treat, where it's more of a drive through and look at the various cars and that's being organized through through Osgood. So, so the Osgood families will get more on that. And it is specifically for Osgood families, but it's a good, it's a good uh, sort of example of a, a different spin on a socially safe Halloween event where obviously the kids are staying in their cars other than those cars that are set up and they have to stay within their parameters too. But you can see some really interesting costumes uh, and have the kids can have some fun voting for uh, who did the best job in, in their estimation of setting up a, a Halloween-like theme. Uh, and then of course we have the Safe Harbors event where we have our pumpkin carving, which I know a lot of folks have been involved with that. And I believe the judging happens on the 30th. So thank you to those folks who have been involved with that. So those are my words on Halloween. I know we'll get deeper into it, but I, I just, I'm really advocating for uh, looking for alternatives than going door to door. Um, and I know the school committee has some thoughts on that 
moving forward when we get to their section. And I wanted to give- um, Dr. Sullivan? Yes, of course, Ellen. Sorry, I just have a question, not on Halloween, but on um, when you're talking about the um, positive cases and how important it is for the school members of our school community to report in, could you just remind everybody, should they call you? Should they call the head nurse? What's the protocol for report? Uh, they should call the school nurse. That, that's what we're looking at. Um, our head nurse, we have a really good communication chain uh, that just really lets those folks who need to know the information know. But our head nurse will will be will be told, and obviously they should, if if they you know contact their um, their public health official. Uh, Mary Goodwin is the one who really runs a lot of this for us. But um, if if folks have a situation, they should reach out to us uh, and let us know because it just it helps us keep things safe within the schools. So they should contact the nurse. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see, I was gonna let um, Dr. Scollins talk a little bit about our exciting professional development. Uh, Dr. Scollins has worked really hard on this with uh, Alisa Gittins Carl, our MECO director. I feel like this is the most anticipated uh, professional development because if you all remember, we had a, a really comprehensive professional development on cultural competency set for our, all of our staff last year on March, I think it was the 20th, and we ended up closing down on the 13th. So this has been waiting since then to happen, and it's happening in a different way. So Dr. Scollins, if you want to update um, briefly on this, it'd be great. I do, and I can you see the um, brochure? Fantastic. Um, yes, it's as long anticipated and um, we're so fortunate because actually we had um, eight presenters and six could come back. So um, we really feel fortunate about that. Um, it will be virtual. It will be on October 30th and um, oops, sorry, I went a little fast there. And um, it's, oh, sorry, it's hopping around. Sorry about that. It just keeps hopping. All right, let's see how we go. Um, and so really it's um, the next step in what we started when we did our professional development in the beginning of the year, uh, we have Dr. Felice Warnham. She is back as our keynote speaker and she spoke with us on uh, the right before school started. And um, we have, I'm just gonna kind of scroll down. It's all day long. And we're working with Lisa Redden, our new director of technology, as well as our IT department to make this as seamless as possible. So I'm excited and nervous all at the same time because we're gonna have um, about 150 people going in and out of breakout rooms and Zoom and um, throughout the day. And um, so we have four sessions and we have seven speakers um, in addition to Dr. Warnham. Uh, and it's about a 15 minute presentation for each. And this is a brochure we sent out. We are in the process of collecting everyone's uh, wishes for which sessions they would, um, which presenters they would like to see in each session. Um, and I'll just quickly go over some of the um, topics. So uh, mirrors and windows approach to addressing issues in race and racism. And this, this phrase of mirrors and windows, it's a way of um, offering opportunities for people to look at themselves and then look outside um, on their reflect based on their reflections and looking outside in society and kind of making some connections. Um, so we look forward to uh, Dr. Carol Blake, who is um, going to come in and speak to us about that. Um, and uh, Elisa did, uh, Gittins Carl did such a great job of collecting um, such a nice eclectic group of, of individuals to work with us. Um, the next one is going to be code, code switching, um, how our students navigate bicultural environments. So again, another way to look at um, kind of the impact of social emotional, um, the, the impact that um, we have to look at on our kids around social emotional uh, learning um, and, you know, kind of what the educator's role in is all of that. And that is um, Dr. Joanne Allen Willoughby. We have um, the middle school mindset, discovering who you are in the midst of others. And this is um, Manuel uh, Fernandez, and he is the head of the school of Cam in, uh, the Cambridge Street Upper School in Cambridge. So he's going to, um, you know, kind of share some of his um, work around uh, cultural identity. 
Um, and uh, not, and if you kind of see quickly, a lot of these um, presenters are involved in the METCO program too. So that's a really nice thing for us um, as that kind of brings some people together that are in the same, um, same um, programming as we are. Then we have um, Latifa Robinson Frank, and she is going to do some work around special education and identifying and supporting students of color. Um, studies show that often students of color um, have a higher rate of being identified for special education. So um, I think it's always important to keep that um, at the forefront of, of when we're looking at students. Um, and a culturally proficient classroom, a welcoming environment, and that's Kathy Lopes. She's a social worker who's uh, going to um, kind of, I probably, I would say, um, extend on the work we did with Monica Belton in the beginning of the year and also Lauren Dargan. Um, and then um, we have reflecting upon equity um, in the Cohasset schools. And um, that is, um, um, oh, I don't, I look, I just see, I don't see her last name on there. Sorry, so I'll have to uh, put her last name in there. Um, but um, those are the presenters that we have. Um, and so we're really excited about making it all happen. So any questions about that? I have a question. Sure. Uh, last year, when it was going to be in person, I was going to get to go. Can I still come? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I sent you everything, right? I sent the I sent the committee um, the sign up form. So go right ahead and sign up. Thank you. Okay. Maybe the committee can join us if they would like. Um, but this is a continuation and we're going to continue to do this. This is all obviously part of um, our, our strategic plan and will be part of our new strategic plan and will be part of our goals uh, as a leadership team. It's great. It's really important, Dr. Scullin. So thank you so much. This is going to be, I think, a wonderful professional development experience for the faculty. And it's, uh, I think, part of, uh, part of an, you know, an important uh, sort of uh, you know, new initiative that I know that the current administration is pushing. And it's, it's, it's Frankly, uh, I think integral to the development of you know socially responsible and healthy adults, and that's what we're trying to produce here. So, thank you so much for doing that. I think this is a great step in that direction. Thank you. Thanks to Mrs. Giddens Carls for all of her hard work. She found a little people. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Well, um, if there are no further questions, then for uh, Dr. Collins, I'll move to the next item on the agenda. If it's okay, I'd, I'd like to, uh, we had put um, the director, the introduction of Lisa Radden, our director of technology and digital learning, new position um, at the end here, because I just wasn't sure when Lisa was going to arrive. It actually fits better if I do that now, if that's okay. Absolutely. Lisa yeah. Here. That makes sense. yeah. Welcome, Lisa. And if you notice, the director of technology is actually wearing headphones, the only one <laughs> of us. <laughs> who has a good sense of actually getting a good, oh no, look, we got Lydia, sorry Lydia, a good good idea with sound quality. <laughs> so that maybe there's a there's a, a first, uh, first tell that there's gonna be some assistance coming our way. So anyway, um, I, I'm excited to welcome Lisa Radden to our team. She's already made a uh, an impact and is, um, is doing all the right things and meeting with people. Um, Lisa, obviously this is our newly created position of Director Tech, of Technology, and digital learning. Lisa will lead initiatives and in instructional technology throughout the district. She will also be collaborating closely with district and school leaders, which she's already begun to do. Teachers, staff, instructional specialists, and of course, Ron Menard, um, our CIO for our town and his team to support and to approach um, all, all matters technology as we move forward as an ed tech district. Lisa comes to us with a variety of leadership experiences, including working in school settings as the director of technology, leading website development, supporting staff using G Suite tools, creating technology video tutorials, and leading staff collaboration by establishing online professional learning communities. Um, her resume includes positions as director of technology at the Boston Renaissance Charter School, um, and most recently, as the Director of Digital Learning and Instructional Technology at the International School in Florence, Italy. Can't believe she actually came back and she, <laughs> we're lucky she did. That would, must have been an amazing experience. Lisa comes to us. Lisa is a Notre Dame grad and a fighting Irish 
um, person uh, <laughs> at, at, in our heart. Um, and she comes to us with a master's in instructional technology from Harvard University. Uh, Lisa is also an instructor at Harvard University's Technology Innovation Fellows Program. So perhaps some of those uh, interested students might, might find uh, some, some support in helping out the class of public schools as they too learn. It's one of my dreams. Uh, anyway, Lisa is, is, uh, is centered here in the central office but she um, is obviously spending a lot of time in our classrooms, working directly with um, our staff, with our leaders, and is already making the rounds uh, to help and really hit the ground running because you know, we need it as everyone does. And we're lucky to have her with us. So I wanted to formally welcome Lisa Radden to our new position of Director of Technology and Digital Learning in the district. And I'll leave it to you, Chair McClellan, if you want to ask any questions of Lisa. Um, I don't have any questions. I just want to say welcome. I've uh, had the uh, great fortune of uh, meeting uh, Lisa personally, and uh, she seems absolutely wonderful. And it uh, comes at a very opportune time for the district. So we are uh, uh, absolutely uh, very grateful to have you. And we feel very lucky. Um, you uh, become very highly recommended. And uh, Dr. Sullivan was extremely excited um, in hiring you. So um, welcome. It's a wonderful community and I think that you'll love it here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, your, the leadership team in this district is, is absolutely lovely and I think you'll enjoy working with them. I don't have any questions though. I don't know if any members of the committee do. I just want to say thank you very much for the warm welcome and the introduction. Thank you. We're very happy to have you. <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. You're wonderful. So um, I can actually, Lisa, you, you, that was a quick introduction, but I wanted to make sure they, they got to see you. Um, and uh, you know, obviously we'll, we'll be having Lisa come back to update on uh, various uh, projects and uh, initiatives that we're carrying forward. And there's yep. a lot of them. And but Lisa's gonna be working really closely with Cassie O'Brien, who is our instructional specialist down at the elementary. Um, and it, there's a lot of work to be done ahead of us, but it's exciting because you know it's a it's a time when your position could not be more valuable. So thank you for being here, and I'll I'll let you have a have a good evening and <laughs> depart us. But thank well, you. thank you very much. I appreciate. It. I already feel uh, the warm welcome uh, as I've been meeting with staff and starting to talk to students and uh, leadership, and it's uh, I'm just really excited to be here. So thank you again. And we're going to have make sure that uh, Lisa is also going to be a, a good uh, asset for, for families and parents as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll create opportunities for her to connect and to help guide uh, through them through some of the technology. Uh, I can only speak for myself as a parent who, you know, who is involved with this, but it, there's some there's some tricky, tricky stuff out there as you're trying to navigate everything that's coming at you. So uh, Lisa will be able to help with that. So. All right, thank you, Lisa. Have a great night. So, uh, Dr. Next Sullivan, up, yes. if I could just interrupt you, um, I, I missed a, um, I, I missed a question related to something you um, mentioned earlier in your superintendent's report. So I just wanted to, uh, to address it. Um, it comes from Mrs. Laura Soderberg of 16 Black Horse Lane. She asked, "Can you highlight for the school community how we were successful in having no?" quote unquote, close contacts identified within the school body given the two student cases who presumably are members of one of the cohorts and in person during two days per week. What were the critical factors implored? I think she meant explored, of course, without giving specifics of the individuals involved. Yeah, it's tricky to do that. So just to kind of go over the process, um, obviously, you know, if someone is symptomatic, we the, the contact tracing goes back two days from the onset of their first symptom. If they're asymptomatic but they test positive, it goes back two days from the um, the positive of the test when the test was taken. Um, and we've always followed those rules. Uh, our cohort does allow because if you, you obviously you have Monday, Tuesday is a cohort, Thursday, Friday is another cohort. Um, it does allow some days in between. Weekends are, are important too. Days off, such as uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, which was recognized on the 12th is, is a day that gets counted in there. Uh, and we're really, I wanna just stress, we're following instructions from our Department of Public Health. 
I'm not making these decisions arbitrarily. We are leaning on our health experts who are telling us exactly uh, based on the scenario, who would be a close contact and who wouldn't, what the timeline is, what the timeline governs in terms of close contacts. And we were, we were uh, informed that, um, that, the, uh, the, 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 that these situations um, were, were clear of that within the school building. So that was a, that, that's really all I can say without giving too much specific information. Um, as I mentioned in my communication home, whenever there is a situation, we immediately are a close contact trace and any individual who is a close contact, which means the person has been within um, six feet for 15 minutes or longer in duration, um, they will be communicated to by our Department of Public Health and told that they would, will need to, to quarantine as a close contact. Um, and uh, it, uh, before I send a message out, I will we ensure that every person who is a close contact is communicated to privately. Um, and then we send the uh, communication out. And I'll be as specific as I can within my messaging. I hope that is adequate to answer that. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Mrs. Marr, do you have a point to make? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that um, the identification of the two individuals has not been made as to whether they were student or staff members. So the question was predicated on, on an assumption that they were students and for privacy reasons, it's not being disclosed and it shouldn't be disclosed, in my mm -hmm. opinion. I think Dr. Sullivan identifies members of our school community, which is, which is always what we would give notice of, any members of the school community, which is, which is any number of individuals. Right. The question was specific. To, it, it said students in cohorts. Yeah, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to make any assumptions. It, it really. I, I would just given the rules around what we do when we, you know, close close contact trace. It's so you know there, there are people that sometimes aren't in the building for various reasons, um, but you know if it if it is ever going to be a student, those are some of the things that are set in place. And if it's an adult, you know sometimes adults aren't in our building for other reasons. Uh, once it could be a situation where, you know, this is hypothetical, but you may have a situation where you have an adult who is a close contact and is under quarantine and then finds out that uh, he or she is a, um, is indeed positive, And then they contact trace appropriately back uh, based on, you know, who they were around. And if they hadn't been around because they were quarantining, that's why we quarantine then they, they would, you know, there, there may be a situation where there's no close contacts in a particular place. So the, all of those things are considered and that's, what, that's what's happening as we're able to, you know, give you information. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Okay, great. Um, so I want to move on to a, just a quick uh, update on our strategic plan. So uh, as you all know, we have a five-year strategic plan. We are in the last year of it. Um, and uh, we will be on November 4th visited by, I believe Dr. Borstel will be visiting us, uh, who's working with, uh, with us as a consultant. We actually have some excellent consultants um, that are helping to develop our strategic plan, which will be going forward, our next uh, plan, uh, including Dr. Borstel, former superintendent. We have um, Gary Mastasis, I don't know if it's Dr. Mastasis, Mastasis? Maestas, yeah. Is it Maestas? Yeah. yeah, from Plymouth. From Plymouth, yeah. He, um, great man and a, a fantastic superintendent. You know, someone to you know, all superintendents should want to aspire to to be like fabulous educator. And we're lucky to have him working with us on our strategic plan. Newly retired, he is uh, just uh, over the last few months. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's 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 coming in knowing what we're going through. Um, because he's lived it, and also with a, a good amount of knowledge. And then Ed Lee, who uh, is a current consultant in Boston Public Schools, but was also um, a uh, educator in Charlestown and a, a principal in, um, I believe, Whitman Hanson at, at a point in his career. So uh, really experienced educators working with us uh, and helping us lead our, our strategic develop, uh, plan development. I'm just going to share my screen because we did, as we do each year, we review, oh, 
Dr. Sullivan, I have a question before you get to the past plan. About okay. the plan. Will you have a school committee member on the strategic plan group? Because it sounds like you've been doing some work already. Yeah, uh, um, we haven't actually done a, a lot of work, Ellen, so don't worry. We, we, but we've set up a, and you, you'll learn about this on the 4th, we've okay. kind of set up a calendar and now we're accumulating data. Yes, there'll be a school committee uh, member, it couldn't be two school committee members, but I don't believe you can have three because then you have um, other problems with it. But um, we also could create subcommittees of the of the uh, of the strategic plan uh, group. So there's a there's a, there's a few groups in it, and you'll you'll have a, a deeper explanation of all of this. But there's a steering team, and the steering team consists really of community members. Um, and what I mean by that is it's really uh, important town officials, other community members that um, would help get sort of an overarching a view of where our schools are in place of the whole town. Then you have a, a strategic planning team and the strategic planning team would absolutely have school committee members on it. But there's also the possibility of having uh, subcommittees off of that strategic planning team, which could involve more school committee uh, representation. And, and I welcome that. And I think that's gonna be important, but. I don't want to steal Dr. Borsell's thunder because he's going to talk about all of this in specific detail on November 4th. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just, I just didn't know if all the members knew that um, school committee should participate, you know, in development of the strategic plan since this I, one's been around for five years. Yeah, school committee should absolutely participate and have a, I, I would believe, have a major role in it. Um, and it's where, you know, obviously, uh, Dr. Scollins, if you want to speak of it a little bit, you can, because we're opening it up a little, so go ahead. Right. So um, you'll be receiving some invites, too, to some of the forums that we have set up, um, and those will be happening in November, um, as well as a survey that's going to go out to families. But um, we've broken it down so that we're making sure we're getting um, voices from all the stakeholders um, as we're kind of collecting our data and information. And I'm working uh, with... Um, Barbara Swanka and Sue Owen and Lisa Radden, as we collect data for um, for specific areas, budget, um, special education, achievement, technology, all those things. So we're collecting all of that also as we, um, you know, as we move into the process. And Dr. Borstel is going to come and speak with us, but um, we'll be setting up those uh, after the forums. Then those there will also be committee work. And so I think um, you kind of covered it, Dr. Sullivan, but um, our hope is to, and, and it's gonna be actually a three year, not a five year plan, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. and so um, I think that nowadays it's, it's too hard to, you can, you can be thinking forward at five years, but things are changing so rapidly that really three years is kind of that, um, you know, that kind of sweet spot as to what, you know, what you can move forward on. So, uh, but you'll be getting information relatively soon, I hope in the next week or so. And the strategic plan should drive really everything in our district. I mean, we should always be able to look at our strategic plan. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here with the school committee, but and draw a straight line to our, our school improvement plans, our building goals, our teacher goals. And this, this should all be data driven. And uh, part of it is, you know, to start with the data necessary to make sure we have uh, the correct uh, columns or uh, key initiatives, strategic goals. And I should know, should let you know that every year we begin the year as a leadership team by looking at our strategic plan. It's a, it's a really um, dynamic document that you look at and, you know, two years ago, we wouldn't have had remote learning as something that we had to really focus on. Maybe we should have, but um, certainly it is something that we're, we're looking at now. So without even sharing the doc, because I know you have it, I, I'll just review quickly some of the um, key elements that we've added, and there's only a few that we're really focusing on this year. So uh, the strategic goals of our um, plan are to recruit, retain, and develop exceptional teachers is the first one, to ensure that all students are able to achieve appropriate uh, growth in learning, um, to promote, third one is to promote the social and emotional well-being of students, and fourth is to strengthen the safety and security of schools, and finally, um, 
to create vehicles that strengthen relationships among critical education stakeholders. What we've added in our final year of the plan and everything is in play um, to our first strategic role, which is to recruit, retain and develop exceptional teachers. Um, this we feel goes a long way with um, our goals around cultural competency as well, but it's to explore a strategy to recruit a more diverse staff. And this is um, most likely, and I think very importantly, going to be part of our next strategic plan in, in depth, but we felt we needed to do that now. So we're going to be, as a leadership team, really brainstorming and looking at ways to uh, diversify our staff, um, and that will hopefully be put into play uh, even before we have our next strategic plan developed. Um, Adding, we added one to our um, second strategic goal, which is to ensure that all students are able to achieve appropriate growth and learning, um, which is very apropos of what we're in right now. And what we added as a key action was to develop supports for all students to minimize learning gaps as in-person learning increases. So we're really gonna create an action plan for that uh, looking at the data that we accumulate uh, along, you know, throughout the year to look at our students who are full remote in PECA, our students who are um, in person in the hybrid, and to, to make sure that we have a good sense of what learning gaps are for all of them to help, uh, help, set, help create a, a structure and an action plan to resolve those gaps. Uh, we didn't add anything necessarily for our third um, third uh, kind of key our strategic goal, but just again, it's to promote the social and emotional well-being of students. We we felt that what we had in place and what we are focusing on this year, which includes developing uh, and adopting self-assessment tools in order to identify district needs, um, implementing SEL assessments developing strategies to embed tiered SEL into our curricula and adjusting strategies, incorporating professional development that allows teachers to define and model differentiated instructional practices, developing an appreciation for diversity and individual differences and focusing on cultural competency and inclusive practice, which we added last year. It wasn't on our original five-year plan. Um, we felt those were really sufficient and grounded in the work we wanna do moving forward. The fourth goal, which is to strengthen the safety of our school. Um, we, we did um, talk a little bit about, um, and this I guess ties into our fifth goal as well, uh, but we did talk about adding all of our protocols and reviewing our protocols for um, safety. And then finally, in creating vehicles that strengthen relationships uh, between critical educational stakeholders, we added to formulate and meet as a joint management labor committee. And this is a, uh, a, board, a, a group that would involve school committee and administration. And then across the table would be the, um, the teachers from our, our unions and uh, specifically our Classic Teachers Association. And it's an important, uh, I believe, very foundational and very important to have, particularly in these days, but really, in, in, in any day to be uh, on the same same page. And this group would meet monthly to uh, discuss issues that were happening between labor and management to try to resolve them. And if needed, to go back to the table with um, any MOU or MOA, I should say, memorandum of agreement that we have formulated with our, with our, uh, our teachers. So those are the just, I just wanted to mention those is very important and some, some uh, elements that I thought you should be aware of um, in addition to everything that we, you know, we're doing as, uh, as practice in the fifth year of our fifth year strategic plan. Any questions on any of that from this team? Any questions? 
Thank you for the update, Dr. Sullivan. Um, much appreciated and much appreciated for all the work that's gone into that to date. Um, I just think this might be a good time to, uh, to mention, I think we probably have like an optimal level of attendees at this point, just to remind everyone that next week, a uh, week from today on October 28th, we'll be having a special school committee meeting to, uh, with the sole purpose of revisiting the current learning model and discuss any uh, necessary or warranted uh, adjustments or modifications to that learning model. So. Please, um, I, I uh, implore everyone to participate in that uh, in that meeting. Um, your participation has obviously uh, helped get, get us to where we are now. So uh, please consider attending that meeting uh, virtually uh, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Craig, can I put a, a quick shout out for our survey that has been distributed to the uh, community? We've had um, about over three, around, what is it? 300 or 200, how many uh, takers so far, Dr. Scholes? I'm sorry, the question again, sorry. Uh, how many people have taken our survey so far? Um, a little over 300. Yeah, so we, we've had a good participation rate and I'm obviously gonna put that out again, but we're, we're trying to get that information uh, ahead of time so that we can analyze it and then present it in a um, cohesive fashion to the school committee. And as I mentioned, we are doing work with uh, focus groups with students, surveying staff. I just got word from our CTA president that that, that staff survey is going out tonight. So that's good. And um, yeah, so please do that. And I look forward to the 28th. I think that's it for us uh, in terms of our updates. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, turning to the next agenda item, which is the special education um, update. We turn to our director of super student services, excuse me, uh, Barbara Saranka. Good evening, everybody. Um, so a couple of updates for you. It feels like it's been um, a long time since I've been able to be on a school committee meeting and stay on, thanks to the good weather here in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Or, or Barbara, I think it was two updates. She's been kicked off because of rogue storm. So I'm looking out my window, it looks all right. So go ahead, Barbara. <laughs> Oh, so I feel like I kind of have some old news for you as well as some, some updates. Um, I, I don't believe I ever had the opportunity to introduce to you that we have a new elementary team chair. So I want to tell you that um, she is on board and doing a fantastic job. Her name is Kamlawati Simpson. She goes by Kay Simpson. And uh, she comes to us with a lot of experience and she's really um, hit the ground running and making nice, um, nice contacts with, with children, with families and with staff alike. And um, and so we are a, a full department. So that is very good news. Um, I've been doing an awful lot of visiting of the schools, both with our leadership team and on my own, uh, visiting classrooms, visiting teachers, staff meetings. And um, it's just really great to see everybody. And it's great to see the kids when they're there in person. They're so excited and ha so happy to be there, much as our student representative referenced all the way down from pre-K all the way through 12. So that's great. Um, as a department, we continue to kind of, as um, Superintendent Sullivan referenced, to dipstick and to see how our children are doing. Obviously, within the world of special education, we have some specific guidance from DESE around how we are doing that and what we are looking for. Um, we're being very flexible and nimble and making adjustments as we can to really meet the needs of individual children and um, really listening and communicating with families around some of that, as well as measuring progress and so on and so forth. So um, we continue to be very responsive to what we see in terms of access to curriculum in both live and remote learning with our students. Um, I've been having weekly meetings with CPAC, which have been very positive. I'm gonna make a little plug right now if I can, that tomorrow at 11 o'clock is our annual basic rights workshop with CPAC. Um, an invitation went out to all families and a reminder went out to them as well. And uh, the team chairs, both Michael Stapleton, our secondary team chair, and Kay Simpson, our elementary team chair, will be present during that too for a little meet and greet with staff. Um, and Monday evening, we are hosting another family forum night with Drs. Bonato and Plummer. Um, they came to um, our district right at the very, very beginning of us coming um, back live to talk about social emotional learning and students as we re-entered school. 
and we're going to do a six week later check in and have a very kind of informal town hall kind of meeting with them and enable families to access and ask questions and talk a little bit about how we are moving forward as a district in that realm with our students. So does anyone have any questions of me? I do not, school committee, Mrs. Marr. Hi, thank you for the update. Um, it, it's great to hear from you know everybody and I'm glad you have power and I have power and Ashley has power. So <laughs> the last meeting was, was a kind of crazy. Um, you know, as a few years ago, we started rolling out co-teaching um, in, in math and English in the middle school through the high school. Have you seen any challenges to that with the hybrid? Do we have, you know, because we broke the kids alphabetically, it doesn't necessarily balance um, the students in, in a classroom. How mm -hmm. is, is co-teaching being impacted or, and, and what are you seeing with that? So what I can say to you is that, you know, certainly on the live days, we are able to, um, you know, really provide that co-teaching model in a way that the, the students and the families are used to and provide those supports. I think um, as we heard from our student representative, you know, certainly as we hear when we walk around to the buildings, I think the remote days are a challenge for all students. And I think they are a particular challenge sometimes for students with special needs and getting used to alternate forms of those strategies and supports for students, especially in a co-teaching model, is something that it, it is taking a while to get used to and to figure out and to figure out how to deliver it and what is needed in a remote model as compared to an in-person model to really help those kids access the curriculum. I will say that our teachers are getting better at it and um, our students are getting more responsive to it um, as, as both, I think, students and teachers get used to the technology aspect of this kind of service. Um, and we continue to keep a really close eye on it. I think, um, to be honest with you, Ellen, I think for some students who receive the majority of their day from special educators, that's almost a little bit easier to navigate. You're absolutely right. It comes with its own challenges when you're in a co-teaching model. But um, our high school and our middle school staff are really very well supported by their team chair and they are um, just really very, um, they're, they're just so good at what they do and they've been doing it for a number of years that when I talk with them and I get together with them, they really are very forward thinking. They're able to be coming up with solutions almost as quickly as problems come up and kind of shifting and adapting so I think we're really doing quite well. I have one, one more question. Sure. Um, for our students who are out of district, yes. um, I assume that they all have had to follow some of the same safety protocols that traditional public schools have had to follow. Yes. Are, are we seeing, um, I don't want to use the word success, it's too early in the year, but, but are those children adapting okay? And Yes, I've been getting some very good feedback from our out of district placements on what they've been able to provide to our students. Of course, they are considered some of our higher need populations. So a lot of those programs are running, um, you know, four days a week and students being present for all four days of that and one remote day for their cleaning, much as we are. And, um, and students really are um, benefiting from that model and really um, able to access their education and have been able to um, really do a nice job in terms of, you know, making that progress that we hope they continue to make. And a lot of them also um, did participate in some kind of a live version of extended school year service. Oh, so okay. that was helpful as well. Great. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other members of the committee have any questions for Mrs. Sirwanka? Okay, seeing none, I do uh, have one. Um, do you feel that, so I, I'm, I'm very concerned about um, our students that um, have, you know, uh, either disabilities or special education needs. I feel that, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's, it's, it's 
anyone's fault other than the coronavirus. It's just that this particular learning model is, I think, presents a, a unique challenge to those students who who really um, need, and, and you know, I think there are quite a few, and, and I think every student needs, but especially these students need and require, you know, more in-person attention um, in order to truly uh, take advantage of uh, and, and sort of and sort of, you know, extract the optimal amount out of a value out of their education. Um, so I'm just, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of um, a parent or guardian of one of those students. And I'm wondering if, if you felt that um, the communication channels have been adequate and that you've, you feel that you're able to receive um, candid and, and uh, you know, readily accessible feedback from um, the families that are directly impacted by this. I mean, do you feel that there's any limitations that we need to address um, in terms of communication? I mean, I, I know that it's probably so key right now, you know, because they probably feel like they're really on an island, um, you know, the students especially. Um, and my, just, my, my heart weeps for them because I, I, I just can't imagine, you know, um, you know, I understand that, that, that some students are receiving, you know, a, a great deal of in-person instruction and, and that's good, but, you know, still, um, do you, so I guess, you know, this is a very, very long-winded way of just asking you, do you feel that the communication has been open and that you've been, you've been able to, you know, communicate openly and freely with, with the families that are impacted from a student services perspective? You know, I, I have to say, and, and I'm probably going to give a long-winded answer to it because I'm going to try to give an all-encompassing answer. Um, as, as all of you know, I came on board on, on July 1st, and I think my phone probably started ringing on July 1st. <laughs> and I really am someone who's very open with, with families. And I had, you know, very honest conversations with families. Um, I, I have an office in which I can, you know, if I have one person in my office, I can easily socially distance. And I had families into either my office or a very large conference room. So we could have those in-person meetings as well, because I felt that that connection was really important too, and really explained to them how we were moving forward as a department, all of the um, guidance that we were getting from DESE and what it meant in very specific terms for their child. And then I was able to translate all of that information to the staff once the staff came on board and really started working with students. And then our staff has had weekly communication with families and um, in anticipation of some of the guidance that DESE has put out to us, our staff also has been over this first six weeks really filling out and checking in with students in terms of um, me measuring and taking accurate um, data on their progress. And we're setting up meetings with families or whether that be by phone, by Zoom, or in person, or not in person necessarily in the building, but if they would like to come to the conference room or a formal meeting in Zoom, um, to share that data and to look at, and it's so important, where the students left off, where they re-entered with us, what the families can share about that remote learning experience in the spring as compared to this fall, and how our staff sees the students responding and making that progress as well. And take all of that data to really help us make very informed and individual decisions about what else, if anything, we need to provide to children in order to help them learn. And, and that's really what is driving us. And what we really want to do is, is we're all in this together. We want to make sure that children are learning. So I think the communication has been really transparent and very good. I think that um, you are concerned, we are concerned, parents are concerned, but I think they feel as if we are all working together with the same goal in the end. And they know that the, the model that we currently have for each individual child isn't necessarily the end game. That if we see things that we need to shift and change, we will do those things. Um, they also know and have been able to speak to how the remote learning this fall is different and more robust than it was in the spring. So that's very helpful too. And the other thing is that when we made decisions around 
what services were going to be live and what services were going to need to be remote. We really made those decisions based on evidence from the spring about what could children access remotely and what couldn't they. So that helped us kind of drive those individual decisions as well. So I know this was really long. I, I hope it touched all the areas of your question. It, it, it was awesome. It was great. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciated that. So did any members of the uh, committee have any follow-up questions? Mrs. St. Ange? I guess it's kind of to piggyback on yours, um, and I'm not sure if you were speaking specifically about families who were already in special education, and I'm just curious, um, as a teacher in a different district, how, um, I guess, your department is getting caught up on testing, which I know I'm experiencing on my end has been so delayed. Um, and have you guys been able to, um, I don't know, I feel like get caught up if that, I feel like no one feels caught up right now, but. Somehow. Yes, I, I have to say it, it was probably the biggest area of concern for me was the idea of a backlog. Mm -hmm. But I have to say um, our school psychologists are the people who do most of the testing for our district. Um, we were very fortunate this um, summer and, and therefore this fall to be able to add a school psychologist so that we have one at the middle school level and one at the high school level. I know that the testing in both of those areas is just about caught up. It's really going very well and we feel like we are right kind of on par where we need to be. Um, our school psychologist at the elementary level is out on maternity leave. So we have contracted and um, what I actually did is um, I've set up so that we have, um, I have two contracts running and they are on a case by case basis because we were not able to successfully get a um, substitute which would have had you know one school psychologist for the elementary level in our buildings. Um, and what that enables us to do is really um, ha have two sources for us to help us get caught up on all of that testing. And that is already moving forward. And um, families have been very understanding of, you know, perhaps needing to um, put off a deadline or it looks like really we are making virtually all of our deadlines in terms of um, meeting those 30 and 45 day requirements and getting caught up with the testing as well as the new testing that we're proposing for some. Thank you. Any other questions for Mrs. Sirwanka? Okay, Mrs. Sirwanka, very strong and impressive uh, new addition to our uh, leadership team. Thank you so much. Um, it was so good she finally got through the storms. Yes. <laughs> It was well worth the wait. <laughs> it was, yeah. Thank you, Barbara. All right. Uh, moving on uh, to the next agenda item, the finance report. We turn the meeting to our director of finance and operations, Su Susan Owen. Good evening. Do you want to share your screen? I can. Sh I can share it. Uh, I mean, I have them. If you want to, just let me. I got it. Jump in. How's that? That's it. Okay. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, right. uh, I'll let you take it away and I'll, I'll scroll down as needed. Okay, so this is um, the update for September. Basically, it, it covers from July to the end of September. Um, this is the summary budget to actual expenditures, um, which gives you a comparison. I can't see it, <laughs> but that's okay. I have it in front of me. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that. I'll run through all of them and then we can go back and, and look at them. The, uh, let's see, summary to budget. There it is. So it breaks it down by um, personnel, people, transportation. It, it goes through all the cost centers um, and gives you the, the budget, what's expended, what the balance is, what's been encumbered and what is the remaining unencumbered balances. Um, the next slide, please. You can go down a little bit more. I just, I can't see the title to it, sorry. Oh, it's this is the uh, general fund. Summary. All part of the same thing. And then you have a summary. Okay, so this is the school budget summary. 
I'm trying to bring it up on my screen. So the school budget summary um, gives you a breakdown of the summary of our cost centers from salaries to sped tuition to all the way down to athletics. Um, and it gives you the FY19 expended, the FY20 expended, and then it gives you the FY21 actual budget. Um, so you can kind of see what our historically, what it's looked like over the last few years and, and what, where we are in comparison. Um, utilities, I think was one that I was, I was looking at. Um, it went down in FY20, probably because March through June, there was nobody in the buildings would be my assumption. Um, but we can follow it and see, you know, how it goes this year, because now we're back in the buildings. They, you can go on to the next one. Okay. So the next one is my, or the grants and, I'm trying to find it. Give me a minute. There it is. Um, the grants and revolving accounts. So we've started out the year pretty well. It will show you, I, I divided it up, um, starting with the grant, and it will show you, you know, the, the numerous grants that we have. It, there's sub fund account numbers, um, what we have, re, what our opening balances were. So that would be like carryovers. So for Circuit Breaker, we have the 723,000 that we carried in from last year. Um, the receipt to what the FY21 grants are that we're receiving this year, and then the opening balance and receipts of the combination of the two. It shows you to date what we've expended, what's been encumbered, which is what's been on a put, put on a purchase order, and then it gives you our fund balances. So it gives you an idea of what we have about a million dollars in um, grants remaining. Total total grant funding is about 1.1 million or 1.9 million. And then you go down into revolving, and I, I can just touch base. Um, the, the CARES reopening grant is new to us. The CARES grant is new to us. The remote learning grant is new to us. Summer vacation was new. Um, the CARES grant, I know there's been talk about the second round in conversations with the town accountant. We have we had the option of taking it in two parts or taking it all at once. And we did take it all at once. So um, he informed us that we wouldn't be getting the second piece of the CARES grant because we already asked for the whole thing. Um, so I know that's been a question. I've been I've been waiting, um, searching this, the, the website to see, um, but we've already received the full amount that they're going to award us. The school revolving accounts, um, same thing. It, it shows you what, what our balances were when we ended the year last year. Um, or what our opening balances are, what we've received to date. Um, so tuitions and, and fees that have been collected so far, and then it gives you the, the sorry, the, the total of the two. It shows you what we've expended, what's been encumbered on purchase orders, and what's remaining um, is the, the fund balances to carry us through the remainder of the year. <clears throat> so I, don't, I don't know, is there another slide, Pat? Or is that it? Well, there's the revolvings. No, we just went. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's all right. The vehicle maintenance. The, there's the vehicle maintenance. So then there's the vehicle maintenance report um, that I got from Missy. There, there were there was no um, expenditures for maintenance for the month of September from April. Um, they all passed inspections back in May, but the buses weren't really working all summer, so. Therefore, there wasn't a lot of expenditures coming through and no breakdowns other than um, just getting our inspection stickers and getting ready to go for the fall. I don't know if there's questions on any of that. I know it's a lot of information. Um, capital projects are going. The only capital project I think that's still remaining is the projector at the middle of the high school, um, which they're coming in next week to start working on that. And then I believe for FY21, most of our capital projects are completed other than the split in the band. I think it's the, the split in the band room, I think, if I'm correct. Um, skip a school. I've touched base with some of our staff that are taking advantage of the skipper school, and they absolutely love it. They're very thankful that we've offered it to them. They say it's working out great. Their kids love it. Um, 
other than that, it's business as usual, planning, you know, getting revved up for FY22 budget, starting to work on things, things like that with department heads, getting, getting their thoughts on what budget should look like for next year. So it's, it's very busy. We're kind of juggling the close of a year, the opening of a year and the, the planning for the next year all in one. Great. Okay, thank you. So any questions for Sue? Yep, I do. Sorry. Sorry. So, um, so <clears throat> it looks, I mean, we look in good shape. We've expended 18.73% and last year we were at 18.9. Yeah, on, on this screen here. Um, <clears throat> the special education tuitions, we have encumbered everything, which we did at the same time last year. And so we're showing, you know, a, a negative. And when we get to the grant funding, we have encumbered all of our circuit breaker. So my, my question or the thought is, um, A, or, or do we have unexpected special education expenses that um, we didn't count on in this budget cycle? Because, you know, being a few months into the year with $112,000 in the negative in such a large portion of our budget could have a lot of ripple effects. So my question is, we, should we look at maybe what some of those unexpected expenses were and consider, not for right away, but consider uh, speaking with the Board of Selectmen and maybe utilizing the special education reserve fund that we have if we have unexpected special education costs that, that is driving this number. So yes, I agree that we, Barbara and I are going to sit down and go over um, what what is putting us over the you know putting us over the budgeted amount. We have had um, several unexpected expenditures. I'm not real concerned at this point or thoughtful that we should go to the selectmen and look at our spend stabilization, just because the way the last few years that I've seen historically what we have left at the end of the school year. Um, we, we wouldn't have to draw down off the spend stabilization because we'd just be giving more back at the end of the year. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I just, and I, I, I wasn't advocating we go to them now. I just think that that- No, that's, that, 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 that's an option. It's definitely an option. Because we don't know, we, we truly don't know how financially the rest of the year, you know, is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen with mandates from the state for, for teaching and learning and remote and hybrid and all of that. So I just wanted everyone to be aware, you know, two months in, three months in, you know, we're already showing posting a negative and we do have an option if we need it down the road. Yes. Um, then in, in the detail that you sent us, it shows up on the first line of the next page. Um, 5,100 personal personnel total, $99,110. And then in the detail, it's called district column change. And I went through the May 12th budget and I didn't see that in the budget. And I, I just, I'm unfamiliar with what district column change means. So, that was an account that the town accountant set up. It was falling outside of our school budget reporting. Um, I think it's it's it goes along with our column changes um, when when they move from a master's to a master's fifteen or a master's fifteen to master's thirty. Um, it was it was in a in a different accountant that was not falling within the report. So he assigned it a different account number. I can go back and look. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head of what it was under. It was it was just not when we pulled the reports. It was not pulling in as part of the school budget. Okay, because all of all of the um, salary lines. Because I went through the detail from the May twelfth budget, which was our certified budget, and um, and this one, and they all match up. And so all of the salary accounts would have accounted for column changes that's how you build it so yeah i'd be very curious as to what that is I'll, I'll definitely look and get back to you on that one great 
Thanks. Um, just a few more questions, sorry. The, um, under the um, grants, so we've, en uh, we've encumbered all of our um, circuit breaker. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, it's just not, it's, it's because you have actual tuitions to apply against that. Correct. So I, I worked with Teresa and Barbara to um, target which, which tuitions we were going to charge directly to the circuit breaker account and which tuitions would be charged to the school budget. So we put them on purchase orders and incumbent them already. Okay. Um, so there's no questions at the end of the year. Okay. Um, the SPED um, IDA grant to the 240 grant? Yes. The $346,443, is that like confirmed? This, yes, that's been approved. Okay, because that is threefold what it's been historically. So it kind of jumped off the page at me. It, the SPED 240? The 240 um, grant. No, it's typically been in the, in the 300 range back to past years, but um, that's usually a big SPED grant. Okay. It has. It's a, it's a little bit more than the previous years. The 262 grant is not nearly that big. Right. The 262 was the much smaller one. Okay. Because I was looking at last year this time, we had 36,000 in, in the 240 grant. And now we're showing 312. And I just kind of spot checked and flipped through past reports from the last two years. And I, 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 I didn't see 340, you know, a $300,000 number. That's, but maybe I was confusing it with the 262 grant. And then the Medco grant um, of 310. And if you would just check Susan, the beginning, the opening balance in Medco, cause on the August 26th report, I think we had 169,000 in the Metco. Okay. But I could be mistaken. And so this is um, this grant. So this is approved because in the past it would be reported as it was received. And um, I think we had talked about before, can we use some of this grant to pay the bus driver salary that goes in and out of Boston a couple times a day? Yes, and we are. Um, we are. Okay. We have two buses, I believe, that go in and out of, of Boston. Um, and they're, the driver's salaries are being charged to that, as well as we have um, a number of students that are attending TECA from the MECO program. So it's also going to fund some of the TECA um, expenditures. Okay. All right, that's it for my questions. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Uh, Craig, can I chime in here? Sorry, guys, no one can see me. I can't, still can't figure this thing out. I'm afraid I'll uh, jump off screen if I don't. Oh, you can always chime in anytime you want. Thank you. Uh, Susan, this is great. I, I appreciate uh, that you were able to put up um, all the uh, fun, revolving funds onto one page. That was great. I'm glad we did that. Um, the thing that concerns me is um, we still haven't done a walkthrough. And, um, you know, we just talked about projects and sounds like we only got one project um, going and that's not my understanding. I mean, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I, I mean, we had $8 million worth of stuff that we need everything from um, air conditionings to uh, roofs to all that. Um, there was uh, something that was part of all that. I seem to not uh, have that in front of us. Is there, do you have what Michael left us of like the wish list that we were supposed to have? Everything from furniture to um, some of the things that we've even, uh, that we were supposed to actually bring up for this uh, round of funds coming through as special requests. So do you see any, do you know what I'm talking about as far as uh, what we've come up with, what the school basically needs, like such as the roofs and all that? Do you have a copy of that? Yes, yes. We're, so the project I was talking about was the money that was allotted last last year for this July one that just passed. 
just showing the progress that most of those most of those projects are completed. Um, FY22, there's several million dollars worth of requests that are yeah. being carried forward um, awesome. from the middle and high school um, air vents or. Yeah, we need a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, um, can I'm you trying to find it. Can you uh, share that with us next meeting? I'm sorry. No, sure. Um, because I, I sent I had to send a preliminary list to um, capital to the town. And I, I can give you a, a quick over a quick please rundown of what what's on that list. I can put my hand on it. Um so there's the deer the deer hill roof um deer hill rooftop air handlers. Um there's the replace the rooftop units for the middle and high school. There's the bus lease. There are projectors for all classrooms, security cameras, document cameras, replacement of Chromebooks, um, building security fobs for the remaining doors of the schools. And then it gets into other things on the list that are up for discussion. Um, high school track replacement, high school turf replacement, bus parking lot. Replace the fire extinguisher heads at Osgood. Um, plumbing in the high school science room. Hydration, the remaining hydration stations. Replace the dust collection system in the wood shop. Um, so those are it's like 2.1 million in requests um, that are just is preliminary. I know Ellen wanted to have a meeting with the school committee to discuss just our capital requests. Um, because it is preliminary and that's just a draft for now. Um, we've touched base with facilities and DPW and, and what those types of projects are going forward. Um, but clearly nothing's nothing's in stone yet. Well, it's great to hear that we're working on it. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, I was wondering if we could do that um, yearly walkthrough with the rest of the town like we did last year. Can we schedule that? That way we can get a, we can take notes and because it's, it, again, I think it's coming up to crunch time that if we're going to get anything allocated for the end of this year or, or we're going to have to wait until town meeting next year. Yes, I was wondering if um, maybe um, Ellen and Paul and Sue, you wanted to do that as part of a um, one of our facilities and uh, subcommittee meetings. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd also too is I'd, I'd just like to make sure that we understand that uh, all the other committee members I think it's really important to be able to see some of the, I mean, I've seen it, Ellen's seeing it. Um, Lydia, I don't know if you've seen it, um, some of the things that, that we're pointing out. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with the middle school and the high school, uh, the elementary uh, and Deer Hill um, that has really so a lot of flaws that I think that we all need to see and understand what we're talking about. Because, you know, our, I, and I've said it before, uh, you know, our buildings are not up to the cohesive standards. And I think more and more people need to see why, and it needs to be pointed out. Um, these are not buildings that I'm proud of, to be honest with you. I'm proud of the people that run them, but I'm not proud of the buildings. They're not up to Cohasset standards. And I think a lot of the other school committee need, members need to see that as long, in the community, the community, you know, they don't really get to go in to see how bad the middle school is in the bathrooms. And, the, you know, these are, the, your kids are gonna be up there in the middle school. And uh, I was quite horrified. By the uh, and I'm talking about facilities. Remember, I'm only talking about facilities. The bathrooms—they can't wash their hands. Uh, you can't put uh, hot water and cold water at the same time. It's again, this is something that you know. I know uh, that we're gonna for the future. We're looking at stuff going down the future, but I got to tell you, there's stuff there now that we all need to see. So I would invite everybody to go to that, and uh, I think it's important. Um. Uh, I think Alan has a question, Craig. I'm sorry, Mrs. Marr. I'm, I'm trying to do too many things at once here um, while I'm doing this. Uh, 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 please, go That's ahead. Okay. No, no worries, no worries. I just want to make sure everyone understands that there's no special town meeting this fall. Therefore, there's no allocation of capital budgets. So any money that we're strategizing on or requests we're strategizing on will be for the uh, late spring, early summer annual town meeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
I just, Paul had commented about getting money for the end of the year. I just wanna make sure everyone understands that there's no special town meeting. And that's the only place where, where capital funding can be allocated. And we'll, okay. have, we'll, have, um, we'll have to figure out how to do a walkthrough socially distancing and safe. You know, we, we had a nice group last year and what came out of that was the fact that the courtyard doors at Deer Hill were fixed because they were not um, opening properly. The floors were retiled. There was painting that was done. So there are, there are positive things that come out of walkthroughs um, once people do see it. And it's just a question of prioritizing and, and getting the, the work done. And um, I think that would be a, a good thing. So um, any thoughts on when we could do that, Ellen, uh, uh, just in terms of, I mean, I, I'm just thinking maybe Sue and I could um, divide two groups and walk through or. Um, well, I think, I, honestly, I think it's important that, um, you know, we get as many people from capital and budget, uh, capital budget and advisory to go, because at the end of the day, they're, they're the decision makers. And I think we had one from one, um, someone uh, from planning came. So I think it's important to get those dates and we'll probably wanna do it after school, after kids are, are out of the buildings. You know, would you think in the next couple of weeks? Um, yeah, probably before Thanksgiving. So okay. I'm happy to talk to them again and see what the interest and availability is. That's a good goal. I um, basically, um, Sue, you and I can uh, can communicate that. I, I have Michael's communication when he did that, and it was successful uh, because it gave people a good a good insight into where we are with our our uh, our needs and what we're asking for. So yeah, you and I can talk um, tomorrow and get that rolling. All right, that's great. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Mrs. Marr. Any anyone else? I'm just curious if something like that can be done on Veterans Day when people are not in school. I don't know if that is possible, but just an already closed day. Could possibly just a lot of people have the day off. Right, it's a holiday for people. A holiday, so we'd have to have them come in on a holiday. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking like, that's a day that I don't have to be at my school <laughs> so I could see our schools, which I attended. So I think a lot of things actually haven't changed, which is part of the problem. Um, I can break away. I just don't know how many folks from the, you know, other than us would be able to do it, Lydia. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I'm just putting it out there. It's a good, it's a good sure. thought. Yeah. Yeah. We did it late in the afternoon, Lydia. We, we started, um, I want to say at the middle high school, and we walked it. It was about a half hour, 45 minutes, and then we went to Deer Hill, and then we went to Osgood. I want to say we started at like 3.30 or so, because uh, we wanted the buses out. We wanted everybody out except for the building principals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Kearney, I will just say, you know, to your point, like, as I noted earlier, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the buildings all the time these days. And I, I, I mean, they're, they're looking good. I mean, they, they are looking good. They're dated. And I understand what you're saying. I, I, I don't, I don't think that they, you know, they meet the standards we're, we're looking for, um, you know, from sort of a utility and an aesthetic um, perspective, which is why, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing for, for to, to have new schools, new buildings at some point in the near future. But, you know, I don't want to give anyone the impression that, you know, there's not, you know, the roof's not caving in and, and, you know, the windows aren't broken, things like that. I mean, you know, they're, they're, I think, you know, they, they look pretty good to Mrs. Mars point. I mean, the, the Deer Hero School got new floors. It looks amazing. Um, it really does. So, Right, and, and the point, and I, the point I, is well taken, Mr. Kearney. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And um, yeah, and I just again, I want to iterate, reiterate that it, it's not the folks that take care of it because they are doing a fantastic job, um, and I want that to be recognized. And, and to your point, Craig, you know, the the more I, we bring it up, the more it will get fixed. So there, there has been a lot of improvements in the last couple of years. Um, and we're trying to do the best we can. It's just progress. And I just want to keep pushing the progress. That's all. I think it's an important thing to do. I, I think you've always brought that to the committee, uh, Mr. Kearney, and that's, that's important. It's an important perspective. I just want to make clear that, you know, there's not, you know, any, any major, you know, structural problems or anything like that with, with the buildings at this time. Um, 
Uh, there is a there is a question um, from um, from Karen. There's no last name um, or address, but it reads: Thank you, Mr. Kearney, for inquiring about facility maintenance and standards. Do these items relate to the proposed uh, CMT Craig McClellan referenced at the PSO meeting this week? So. Um, I was at the, which one was, I think the Deer Hill PSO this week. And um, I had discussed um, the new schools committee, which we'll be discussing, you know, it's on the agenda now, um, pretty much every meeting. But uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Karen, um, this, this sort of relates to that. Um, I think Mr. Kearney is really talking about the more short term. Um, capital um, requests, but the committee I was talking about relates to the exploration of revised or uh, revitalized or um, rehabilitated or new facilities in the district. So they kind of go hand in hand because they would address some of the same issues, but I think Mr. Kearney was addressing the more short, short term solutions. This, that committee I was referencing in the PSO is a more long-term uh, explorative committee. So hopefully that answers the question. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that again in, in a moment. So um, I guess we're moving on from the finance here, unless there are any specific questions for Ms. Owen. Anyone? Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, school committee comments um, and uh, communications. First on that list is uh, goals. Uh, Ms. Clary, do you have any updates surrounding goals? Just that we're meeting on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, it was just placed on the agenda last time. So, I mean, I, obviously we've been, and, and just to reiterate for everyone, I mean, normally we'd be a little bit deeper into the, the goal development process, but, you know, for obvious uh, and, and readily apparent reasons, we've been focusing on other issues uh, at, the, at the, you know, in this, the beginning of this fall semester. So, um, you know, the first meeting is Thursday and, and, and we're, we're excited to make some progress there now that we're yeah, and it's underway. All right, um, Halloween and trick-or-treating. So I had this um, added on to the agenda because um, I want to have a formal discussion an open discussion amongst the committee members. Um, I, I, I want to open up discussion with the understanding that I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, take a vote on a motion tonight, um, ideally, to make a formal recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to essentially prohibit trick-or-treating in Cohasset this year. Um, it's a very strong affirmative stance, but I think it is warranted given the circumstances. Uh, I, I personally feel that this is a very real threat to the very fragile operations that we have in the school district. Um, we have had some success with it um, in the short term. I would like to enjoy some longevity. And I think that um, not taking an affirmative stance and clearly announcing to the community that trick or treating is, is not to be engaged in this year for obvious reasons. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kid's holiday. The schools are, you know, in operation for the benefit of children, and this holiday is very fun. And, and I, I, I hate to be the advocate for stripping the kids of any sort of events, but it just doesn't make sense, I think, <clears throat> in the current um, state of affairs under the current um, uh, climate to have this uh, to have this sort of uh, celebration take place. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, if you think about it, it's just a sort of chaotic um, uh, grouping of children at night. Um, some will have masks, some might, given the costume, who knows? There's communal bowls where candy's being grabbed out of, hands won't be washed and things will be consumed. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a large gathering of people that's just completely uncontrolled. And it's, it's young, young people that may or may not be, you know, uh, you know, cognizant of the rules while they're caught up in the excitement of the, uh, of the occasion. So, um, you know, while, you know, recognizing obviously the limitations of our authority, all I'm going to be asking, and, and, and perhaps the school committee doesn't agree to it, and that's fine, but I'm, 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 I'm going to be looking for 
a motion to make a formal recommendation to the select board to essentially ban uh, trick-or-treating and cohasset for the 2020 year, given the COVID-19 pandemic. So I just wanted to have you know everyone's opinion and get everyone's thoughts and, and, and deliberate on this a little bit um, to, to sort of protect uh, our, our schools. Um, I think it's in the best interest of the kids. Ms. Caleri, any thoughts? So I guess my question is, I, first of all, I, I, I agree that trick-or-treating is risky <laughs> given the current situation. Um, we as a committee are meant to prioritize the education and operation of our schools. And I think the upcoming holiday season as a whole certainly threatens to um, undermine the progress that we've made um, toward opportunities for in-person education for our kids. Um, that said, I, I don't know how I feel about this yet. I'm interested to know what other members of the committee think. I do wonder uh, if we expect that if the select board were to discuss canceling trick or treating, what that looks like, like what our expectation is around that. Like, is it a proclamation? Is it ideas for enforcement? Like, what does what does what's the end result? You know. Well, I would just say. Again, our authority is limited to making decisions uh, regarding, you know, essentially policy, um, budget, and you know, some sort of, you know, mixture of operational decisions uh, that relate to those two um, regarding the school district. Yeah. Um, so, as you mentioned, we are trying to make the best decisions for our school district, and so I, all this can be is a recommendation, a formal recommendation that I think will have, you know, it'll carry some persuasion, um, if it passes, uh, that the school committee feels that this is just not a safe endeavor, um, you know, for this particular year, given, you know, our, our fragile, you know, learning model right now. But I, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's really in our charge to hash out the particulars of it. Um, that's for, I think, the select board to determine in their deliberations and discuss amongst themselves whether they think enforcement is an issue that would um, inhibit them from taking such an affirmative position. And I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of considerations that they have that are just, you know, beyond ours, frankly. I mean, for me, um, all I care about is that we continue to have kids in the school at some level. And I want to be moving you know, I want to keep this locomotive chugging in the right direction, right? I, 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 want, to, I want to see, you know, in-person hours added. I don't want to see them detracted. And I think that trick-or-treating poses a, a real threat to that and to that, to that mission. And, and, I, I don't, and I don't like it. So, um, and I don't really think that there's a reasonable argument against that position, frankly. But, um, you know, it's up, that's why this is always, it's only going to be a recommendation to the select board. I, it's up to them how they how they do it, whether it's a proclamation, whether it's just a, a town, you know, a one year temporary ban on, on that type of celebration of the Halloween holiday. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, and, and I'm sure people will get together in their own little community groups that they've been, you know, sort of hanging out in any way and figure out safe ways to do that. But going door to door uh, and, and, and grabbing things out of a bowl um, is just crazy. And I'm sure a lot of people that, you know, maybe don't have little kids that probably enjoy the visits from our little friends every year um, in their costumes, probably love it. But this year, you know, probably not so much. So, um, you know, that's, I, I just think that we can make this form. All we can do is, 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 is the size of committee if we think it's warranted action, recommend it to the select board and they manage the town. They're the ones that govern the town and they're the ones to decide how to, how to do it. And, and that's as far as, as far as I see it. And, and, you know, there may be limitations on their authority. I don't know. And then they're the ones that have to decide that. Um, to the extent it's, it's practicable or, 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 or legal, you know, they can make that decision. But I think we can certainly make a recommendation that we feel it's unsafe and it threatens the operations of the school. Yeah, I mean, we're still not in a red zone right now, currently, right? 
No, but we're surrounded by red. Right, right. That was going to be, yeah, right. So, but I just want to make sure I understand that correctly because it seems to me like just like because of how small we are, a, a very small number of cases could put us in the red zone. Yeah. Um, so that is, I think, for me, a reason to advocate for this. Tomorrow's the first, just so everyone knows, tomorrow's the first week where those colors come out on the 20, on a Thursday, as opposed to Wednesday. I've been looking to see where we are, uh, so I, but we, it's not out yet, it's out tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, uh, Craig. Uh, yes, Paul. Uh, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, we are, we're open. There's other communities that are closing because of the, you know, we had Boston closed today. Um, and it would show um, good faith that, you know, we're a community that takes this disease serious, seriously. And, you know, we, uh, we don't want to give up Halloween. We're not saying Halloween, you can't dress up and you can't have fun with your friends. However, trick-or-treating is something that you share the bowl and there's, there's, a, there's a chance of spread. Um, you know, I don't want to sound like we're, you know, trying to um, impose uh, uh, any kind of limitations on folks. However, you know, you make some good points. I mean, we're keeping this we're train chugging and we want to be able to keep the schools open and that's our biggest priority and it's not as much as we don't want to take fun out of Halloween, you know, um, and, and I know there's a comment here because I, I, I heard my wife talk about they're doing a trunk and treat or something. I, there is a question here that regards to that. So there is things in the community um, that are they're, they're, they're trying to, so with some social distancing, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of them to come up with ways. There's a lot of ways uh, that other, uh, other folks are doing it. Our church is doing something different. So I think it, I, I'm agreeing with you, Craig, that we're not saying we're giving up Halloween. We're just giving up the trick or treat pot for this year, just on basis of respect for all the other communities that are, are closing. And the fact that we're just trying to get everything open and have, you know, have fun. I, I, we don't want to take the fun out. Um, kids have, you know, my, my son is already talking about, you know, the school isn't as fun as it used to be. And, and this is something that, you know, it's just one more thing. However, school is, is, is very important. And, you know, I agree with you, Craig. And if it's just a signal of support um, for the community to, to know that we're, we're thinking about them, I'm, I'm all in. Mrs. Thank you, Mr. Kearney. Mrs. Marr, I saw you were raising your hand uh, earlier. Thank you. Um, I agree that, you know, our focus is on keeping kids in the school and, and keeping our, our hybrid model where it is and, and hopefully moving forward into more students in, in school more. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, we do have a meeting tomorrow night. I'm wondering, Mr. McClellan, if perhaps you spoke with maybe the chair of the Board of Selectmen, find out what their authority is or are they planning or is the town health agent planning on issuing some guidance to parents on how how to celebrate the holidays safely, because um, I I concur. I don't I don't think we have the we don't have the authority, but to to cancel trick or treating. Um, but I, I I just don't know enough about what's going on on the town side regarding this conversation from our health officials, our public safety officials, and and what the thought process is. And we do have a meeting tomorrow night where if we had more information, we could then vote tomorrow night. Just a suggestion. Okay. Um, thank you, Mrs. St. Ange. Do you have uh, any thoughts to share? I do. Um, you know, I think it's obviously um, not a fun decision to support, but I absolutely support the idea that trick-or-treating should not be happening on a town-wide scale. My child is next to me right now saying, <gasps> um, <laughs> yes, she's awake and she's gasping, but, um, <laughs> and now crying. But, you know, we have costumes, we have our little quarantine, our neighbors who we've already seen. I think we can all make choices that are healthy and safe and outside <laughs> and spread out. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering the same things the other committee members are wondering. What is, um, 
you know, like this isn't a law, so the police can't be like, you're breaking the law by trick or treating. But I'm wondering if we could issue a letter or something like we did earlier in the year, just, you know, I mean, it's so nice to have our participants on the meeting now, but just to send out a more widespread message to our community to say, here is what we are thinking. We really are encouraging everyone to do this. I think a lot of families are thinking along these lines anyway. Um, I mean, probably not everybody, but I've been hearing talk. Um, sorry for the background editorial comments there, but um, I just, I'm just wondering if like, a, you know, I don't know, I, I just feel like a letter or something might be helpful just to say, here we are as a committee, this is our thought, this is our concern um, and just send it out to the community. Um, yeah, I mean, as usual, um, Mrs. St. Orange, I think that's a really good, you know, you have some really good thoughts there. Um, I think that that would be an, an excellent supplement to what I, I'm seeking. Um, I, in terms of, and to just address Mrs. Mar, Mrs. Mar's comments earlier, I, I don't, again, it's sort of in line with what Mrs. Caleri was addressing, Mrs. Marr. I, I, I'm really not, I, I know that the, the town is well aware of the school's perspective, at least through Dr. Sullivan and I in town meetings that we have, you know, and our, our reservations and apprehension about trick-or-treating. And I know the fire chief uh, also has reservations about the safety uh, surrounding trick-or-treating. I know that the police department and the police chief have concerns about the enforcement of a prohibition of trick or treating. But you know, you know, you know, masks are required in certain places. People shouldn't be getting in social gatherings. You know, things happen where people might not be wearing the mask. People getting involved in large social gatherings, and it happens. And no one's getting indicted or put in solitary confinement. You know, I mean, it's 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 just it's a it's we just, in my opinion, in order to try and. Uh, seek a uniform approach to this, we need an affirmative position. And we need, I think, an affirmative message to be sent to the community. And it's not our prerogative to govern the town. We're just a school committee. We're just in charge of the district. But this is something that is absolutely connected uh, and intertwined with the schools. And while we don't have the authority to make it happen and prohibit trick-or-treating in the town, I think we do have a voice and if it's a collective voice in the way, uh, by way of a, of a vote and expressed to the select board in a respectful fashion, and that our collective voice is then communicated as Mrs. St. Orange suggests um, in, a, in some sort of missive to the, to the stakeholders, um, I think it would go a long way to, uh, I think eradicating what would be a, a very detrimental celebration of the upcoming holiday. So um, that is why I am, I am asking for, um, you know, a motion. I mean, in terms of the specifics of what the town would or wouldn't do, again, that is their charge, that is their prerogative. I am only concerned with what the message is from the schools at this point. And the, 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 the Halloween holiday is quickly approaching. This is, I think, the opportune time to do this. And, I, and this is why I brought it up and put it on the agenda. And I, and I, and I would like, I would like a, a motion uh, to be made to uh, make a formal uh, recommendation to the board, the board of selectmen in Cohasset uh, that trick or treating is affirmatively prohibited for the 2020 year, um, as it poses a realistic threat to the operations of the school, and that we supplement that recommendation with a uh, clear message to the community uh, in terms of uh, what our position is. So, um, and, and I don't want to stifle any conversation. Please have further conversation. I'm just clarifying my position based on the comments that were just made. Mrs. St. Orange. Yeah, I guess I just want to follow up on my comment and saying I just I agree with you. I think that it is silly to let one night undo seven months of hard work on everyone's part. And we have we are this little island, hopefully still unshaded. I mean, I guess we'll find out tomorrow, but an unshaded island amidst very colorful towns. And if we can keep our numbers low and keep our families healthy and keep our kids in school as much as possible, I think that everyone can get behind that. So I, I support the idea. Um, so I just, I just have some, um, some comments from the community uh, that are coming in related to this. I just wanna um, sort of read them. Um, again, uh, Karen, who, <clears throat> who lives in Ledgewood Farm, um, 
it says, my family lives in the Ledgewood Farm subdivision. Our neighborhood is organizing a socially distanced event where we are organizing a spread out event with treats safely laid out at the end of driveways to avoid close contact while facilitating good spirit and humor. So thank you, uh, Karen. That's an example of, I think, uh, a safe, you know, uh, organized event in the small community that is uh, within its, you know, in contact with itself anyway. Um, and, and that seems to be a responsible answer to this. Um, and I think uh, it sort of reflects what Mrs. St. Andrews was referring to um, earlier when you mentioned that, you know, you've heard that people are doing, you know, that sort of thing, alternatives to trick-or-treating. Um, Paul Schubert of the Board of Selectmen at 155 Sawyer Street, he states, this is, this is a very risky behavior. Um, so I, 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 I think that he is referring to trick-or-treating. Um, as we know, um, Paul Schubert is Dr. Schubert. He's a, um, he's a medical doctor, he's a physician. He also um, states that I would recommend that this be a virtual event. I'm in favor of limiting contacts and groups outside of family units. Um, so that's, that's the Board of Selectmen. Um, Mrs. Marr, to your point, I mean, that's at least one um, Selectman uh, who has made their position clear. Thank you, Dr. Schubert, for, for, for participating. Um, Karen, uh, also uh, again of Ledgewood Farm, uh, writes, it is, it is an essential concern for the school committee to address safety first to keep schools in person as much as possible. I support a school committee recommendation, the Board of Selectmen, to vocalize community members acting responsibly. responsibly. Um, another user with the initials DM, I do not have an address or a full name, states uh, that that user states the committee member's suggestion to cancel Halloween is based upon the assumption that kids will be picking candy out of bowls. The state has issued guidance on its site for Halloween dur during COVID-19, which many neighborhoods have already referenced. The guidance includes suggestions such as only holding outdoor activities, placing candy on a platter rather than a bowl and other suggestions. I suggest the committee consider pointing the residents of the town and parents of students to the state guidance rather than suggesting prohibiting activities broad writ. Oh, Dave McDonough of Fair Oaks Lane. I'm, I apologize, Mr. McDonough. I didn't see your name until the end there. Um, I, I think that those are all uh, good examples of uh, safe activities. But again, it seems uh, like Mr. McDonough and um, perhaps some of the, the members of the Fair Oaks Lane community, which is you know a, a very hot uh, Halloween trick-or-treating destination, have probably um, formulated some safe alternatives. But again, without that affirmative message, uh, to me, strictly prohibiting you know trick or treating so the conventional trick or treating going knocking on doors take you know being in very close contact with people taking uh candy from communal you know containers um it looks like fair oaks is, is not doing that and that's great but uh unless it's an affirmative sort of town-wide uniform message there may be other people that aren't part of that fair oaks operation that come by to participate in the trick-or-treating activities that they do every year and i think if we have a clear message or communicate a clear message to the board of selectmen that that you know we're trying to avoid that despite the efforts of individual um, neighborhoods um, it, it will help completely eradicate um, you know that sort of expectation for halloween um, so those looks like all the, the questions in the community at this time uh, any other discussion um, from the school committee members okay um, is there a motion to, uh, at this time, I, I, I'd ask for a motion to make a formal recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to, uh, to prohibit trick-or-treating for uh, the 2020 Halloween holiday and to couple that or supplement that formal recommendation with a clear communication to uh, district stakeholders. Um, is there a motion to that effect on the floor? So moved. Motion made by Ms. St. Ange. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Colleri. All in favor, please indicate so in roll call fashion as your name is called. Mrs. Colleri. Aye. Mr. Kearney. Aye. Mrs. Marr. Aye. Mrs. St. Ange. Aye. Aye, Craig McClellan. So that motion unanimously passes and we will make that recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. Um, I will do that um, along with Mrs. Caleri as chair and vice chair of the school committee. And, uh, and then I will, uh, as I always do, draft something um, that we can all participate in and, and give our input in. And then uh, we'll, we'll send that out to the community. So thank you all for your support in that. I think it's a really important step to maintaining uh, the current operations of our district. Thank you. Um, and I know Dr. Thank Sullivan, you. Dr. Scullins also supported that and we appreciate your support in that um, decision.
and thank you, Dr. Schubert, for chiming in. I think that was helpful to, to hear at least one um, select, uh, select board member's um, views. And Chair McClellan, if I can just say thank you to the committee for considering this, and thank you to everyone out there who's doing something uh, to make Halloween safe. Our ability to have the students in school in person is very fragile. Um, it really is with a, the disease, here, you know, um, impacting so many communities. And we've we've been in a good spot for you know the the time we've been back in school, and we just don't want to jeopardize anything. So your care and thought in that uh, is really appreciated. So thank you. Okay, um, moving on, uh, the new schools committee. Um, I, I, I guess by way of update, just I think um, one of the, the parents um, had early indicated that, that I, I've been attending meetings and I've been trying to spread the word as much as possible. We've only had, I think there's only been two applications so far though. I expect um, one or two others at least because I've been in contact with people trying to recruit people for this important initiative. And again, I'll just sort of explain the new schools committee is being reconstituted. It hasn't been constituted since the 70s to explore um, what uh, our uh, district's buildings and facilities, the physical plant um, need in terms of you know re remodeling, rehabilitation, or uh, uh, new buildings. And, um, you know, I personally would like to see, I think that we do need, I think that we're in need of new buildings. And, uh, you know, I, that's why it was important to me to get this committee formed so that a group of people, objective uh, minds can, can sort of explore that and the need for that. So we're looking, we, it's a nine member committee and we currently have two applications. We would need a quorum um, of at least uh, five, um, I think members, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Mark, um, as our sort of resident parliamentarian and, and uh, most senior member of the uh, committee. Um, but I think we would need five in order to sort of get going with it. Um, and again, I expect one or two in the near future, but please spread the word, even if you're not interested in it, um, please contact someone that you think might be interested in it. Um, there are a lot of highly educated people in this town with a lot of, um, you know, uh, a large variety of backgrounds and professional experiences that they could really add a lot of value to this particular initiative. So um, I don't have any additional updates uh, beyond the fact that we're currently trying to fill the committee. Anyone else have anything to add, Mrs. Marr? Okay, uh, moving on, um, reports from subcommittees, liaison positions, uh, any updates, we'll just go in uh, alphabetical order around the table here. Uh, the, uh, the uh, um, you know, I don't know, symbolic table, metaphorical table. Mrs. Caleri. <laughs> the policy subcommittee met this week. We discussed a couple of policies. Um, one is thank you to Mrs. Owens. She um, alerted us to some changes in bidding requirements. So we'll be looking at um, policy DJE. And we've also started the process of reviewing our um, harassment policy. MASC, M-A-S-C, um, the Mass Association of School Committees, um, sent the harassment policy out over the summer with a lot of the COVID stuff, just I think because the timing coincided, not because it's directly related, um, and encouraged committees to review their harassment policies and their um, handbooks. And we have sort of, um, this review has, has caused us to sort of look a little bit more critically about the structure of our policy handbook and take note of the fact that the mask reference policy doesn't, or reference manual doesn't necessarily align with our table of contents for our Cohasset School District policy manual. And so we're gonna be um, putting hopefully a lot of work into making sure that more closely aligns. Um, and so, um, we're gonna be meeting every other Monday. Those meetings are posted there at 6 p.m. And we invite anyone who has any interest in being there to join us. Did I miss anything, Mrs. St. Ange or Dr. Scollins? 
I don't think so. Did I don't I? think so. I think you okay. covered it. Okay. All right. We're just going to say that I did. Um, <laughs> we did get the week off from reviewing our face covering policy, which was lovely. <laughs> so thanks. Keep up the good work, everyone. Um, Couple of things on the safe harbor front. There are two workshops upcoming that are um, of note. One is October 28th at 5 p.m. It's a webinar and it is on the topic of relationships and substances. Um, there's more information at safeharborcohasset.org including a registration link and more information about the presenters. And there's also going to be a workshop that Safe Harbor is presenting, which I'm particularly, uh, well, I'm excited about all their workshops always, but social media boundaries. This is a very important one. Um, November 4th, 5 p.m. Um, again, there's information at safeharborcrohasset.org, including a registration link. Um, and this is so important so important for us as parents to understand what's happening on social media. Um, I think for our kids, but probably also for us, it's valuable information. Um, so there's more information um, on Safe Harbor's website. And I think that's, oh, and there's a diversity committee meeting on the 28th at 11 a.m. And if you would like more information about attending that, you can feel free to email me a Kaliri at ohassettk12.org. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mrs. Kaleri, and thank you for everyone, Mrs. St. Orange, everyone that's been working on the policies. It's, it's a really, it's kind of a thankless task, but such an important one. As we saw earlier on uh, with the face mask policy, it can be um, something of, a, you know, of, of a significant impact at times. So thank you. Um, any, uh, let's see, where are we? Mr. Kearney, any updates from you? Uh, sure, I, 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 just a couple observations. Uh, first of all, Barbara, thank you for meeting with CPAC once a week. Uh, that is so exciting to hear that there's such good communication. Um, and I just wanna um, reiterate that, that the, you have an annual meeting on Thursday, is that correct? I'm sorry, I'd like to give you the time to. Yes, uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we have our annual basic rights meeting with CPAC. Okay, great. I just wanted to give a shout out, such a great committee to, to, to be part of. Um, yeah, and I just I, I, just an observation as a parent, it's nice to see the, uh, the schools play soccer and uh, that my kids are really enjoying that. And you know, it's nice to see the school up and running. And Dr. Sullivan, thank you. And, and thank you for your team to allow our kids to do it, so. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Glad to do it. Um, I apologize. Um, Mrs. Marr. No real updates. I didn't make it home from work in time to go to the PEB meeting. I'll get an update from Katie Dugan on that. I'd like to thank Sue Owens and Liddy and Mrs. St. Ange for volunteering to be on the uh, request for bid uh, review committee for AEC uh, for some of their projects that are coming forward for regarding solar panels on our roofs on our school grounds. Um, they're very excited by about this. It's been a long time coming, and um, I think anything that saves money is great. Um, I do have a, a question. It's related to goals. Um, we it's actually related to the superintendent's goals and. You know, I hesitate to bring it up because as far as I'm concerned, he's achieved all his goals in getting the buildings opened and getting kids in and getting staff in and, and being safe. But we are legally obligated to have, um, you know, goals for the superintendent and a mid-cycle evaluation. And um, I, I just I just wanted to put it out there and I would I would counsel everyone to keep the goals brief and achievable because it was the day-to-day -day running of the district, which is of the utmost important and um, keeping everyone safe. So I don't, I don't know if that subcommittee has met with Superintendent Sullivan or not. No, not yet. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's me. And I think Mr. Kearney again, perhaps, I, I, I don't even know offhand who it is, but I know I'm on it, but uh, no. Um, oh, are you on it with me this year, Ellen? I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to help. Um, and you know, I, I can sit with Dr. Sullivan preliminarily if you'd like, or 
you know, um, <clears throat> I, I just, I think it's, it's, it's important. So um, if you want to mull it over, let me know. Sure. I mean, I, I have no problem with, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, we certainly need to, to make some headway on it, obviously. It's just, you know, all these normal things have sort of been backburnered and, and I'm, you know, I, I feel like I'm sort of at, at the end of my bandwidth a little bit in terms of like what I can, it's just, there's just been so many things that have been popping up. Um, and <laughs> forget me, I, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, Dr. Sullivan having to sort of develop these, like, you know, any evidence or whatever, get these things together on top of what he, I don't, I'm not even sure that um, he's eating or sleeping now. Uh, maybe you just have like a, some sort of a car battery hooked up to him or something well, I'm like eating, that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sleeping very much. <laughs> so, so, but you're right. And I, you're, it's an important thing to bring up. And, and frankly, I, I think I would have further neglected it if you hadn't. So um, maybe just to get the ball started, um, Mrs. Marr, maybe, maybe you could um, sort of, uh, Mr. Kearney, if it's all right with you, I, I don't know, it would, it would be helpful to me. And uh, I don't want to speak for Mr. Kearney as well. If he, I can't remember if he's doing it with me this year. He was on it with me last year, but uh, if it's okay with, with you, Mr. Kearney, I, I, I wouldn't mind Mrs. Marr sort of taking the, the, the reins on that for a bit. Yeah, that's, that'd be fine with me. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you volunteering that, Mrs. Marr. Thank you. Yeah, if it's any uh, solace to you, I, my colleagues have mentioned that they're all in the same boat. There's not a lot of, um, I, but I, I would appreciate that. That'd be great. You know, I have some thoughts and I think if we can come out in November with goals, I think we'll be okay, you know. Yeah, and then, and then the mid-cycle can, it doesn't have to be January. The mid-cycle can be, you know, March and yeah. right. down, but um, I, I think it's important. All right, so Dr. Sullivan, I'll touch base with you and we'll schedule some time. That'd be, that'd be wonderful, thank you, Alan. Thanks. That's, that's all I have. Okay, uh, thank you, Mrs. Marr. Uh, Mrs. St. Ange? Um, yes, as Mrs. Marr said, Susan and I are, um, have joined the Solar RFP Evaluation Committee and we met tonight for the first time just before this meeting um, to kind of calibrate as a group. So we will be looking at bids starting, um, I think as early as this Friday, is that right, Mrs. Owen? Yeah, so that will be an exciting, fast-paced process um, with hopefully some outcomes that can benefit our schools. Um, I will be meeting with the Deer Hill School Council next Thursday, you know, as, as everything's kind of bumped out at the beginning of the year, we'll be meeting for the first time of the year, but I'm looking forward to that and we'll be able to report on that afterwards, um, I think. And then Mrs. Caleri spoke to policy. So that is my update. Okay. Um, I, I just briefly <clears throat> have met with uh, various groups, including the um, Deer Hill PSO I mentioned earlier, the Osgood School Council, um, and um, and then the um, oh, the Alternative Energy Commission, which a committee that you just did, Ms. Ms. St. Orange, you just mentioned that, didn't you? Okay. So, um, that's all I have. Just that, that those, I mean, pretty much was the first meetings of those groups. So just that they're sort of up and running and, and, and going again now that we're back in operation. So, um, you know, not too much by way of substantive reports, just sort of an update that it's going on. And I did that. Um, all right. Uh, any other school committee comments or communications or updates from anyone? All right. Seeing none, moving on to approval of minutes. We don't have any minutes to approve this meeting. My understanding is next meeting, we, we may have some, but not the next meeting, because the next meeting is a special meeting. Um, not So we won't be approving minutes on October 28th, but on the following meeting after that. Um, unless we want to, I guess if they're ready, maybe we can make a vote. Um, and um, follow up and updates, no follow up and updates, no topics that I know of that are, are not reasonably anticipated within 48 hours by the chairperson. Uh, anyone have any, any topics? Mr. Kearney, anything? Yeah, you know, I was just uh, wondering, uh, as far as the middle school, it just seems like the kids aren't getting a, uh, a mass break uh, as much as the high school kids are. Is that something um, just... Uh, yeah, um, I think they're, they're getting organized mass breaks, certainly uh, after lunch and during various times. Um, of the day uh, in terms of as many as the high school, that may be accurate, uh, but I still think they're, they are getting mass breaks. I'll look into that, Paul. To, yeah, to please do. That. 
Yeah, you that know. comes from Jack. <laughs> okay, well, Jack. Yeah, well, I mean, this is that the student voice is really important. So, I mean, I think that's uh, that's something that we're going to find out as we um, work with our student focus groups on Friday. So, thank you, Jack. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, there are, there are a couple of types of mass breaks. Obviously, there's the organized ones, and then there's the ones that you know students might need to take. Um, and teachers have been very flexible with that. You know, do you guys need to take a break? Well, let's go go do that. So you know, I would always um, you know promote advocate students advocating for themselves uh, in that regard. So thank you. So yeah. so make sure you do that too, Jack, and uh, we'll look <laughs> that, uh, Paul and Jack. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. The other the other concern is, and I know this is tough, but maybe I was thinking that uh, we could uh, the lunch schedule. Um, you know, he's having lunch at ten thirty, and his when he comes home, his uh, his lunch box is full of food. Uh, I feed him when he gets up, um, and when he's here, you know, his sisters make him sandwiches. Like, you know, he eats well when he's here, but you know, it's 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 kind of a bummer to open up his and I been trying to bribe them and I don't know what this the kid's a good eater I mean the kid eats all organic um great food it's just that uh he says he's not hungry at 10 30 in the morning and again this isn't about Jack I'm just throwing it out there about no it, it is hard and one of the things with the limited amount of uh, seating that we can provide in a lunch uh capacity you know we we made determination in our district to not have uh, food being served in the classrooms. And uh, because of that, um, you know, we obviously need to be six feet apart. There are allergy concerns. There's a lot of right. a lot of thought into that. But because of that, you know, we are bound to use the spaces we have available for lunch, which are for us, the gymnasium and the cafeteria. And because we have two schools, you know, to your facilities comments, Paul, because we have two schools sharing the same major facilities that we can provide lunch, the lunches do have to be spread out across, you know, really what amounts to seven grades. Right. So um, it is a challenge and the 1030 is our earliest. It's whatever it is in that area, it's definitely in that area. And it's a, uh, it's our, it's our earliest lunch and it is a challenge and the latest lunch is, you know, past one, two, and that is a challenge. Right. So we're hearing that, we're seeing it in the survey. I, We'll we'll keep working through it, but this is a tough uh, it's a tough one for us, or from an operational standpoint, based on what we have for facility, um, and based on the limitations and the amount of people we can put in a given space to serve them lunch. Because remember, they're having their masks off, obviously to eat. They have to be facing the same direction, and they do have to be separated uh, by six feet. So it is a challenge. Um, before we uh, move on to, uh, to or close the meeting, I just want to, um, Karen of Ledgewood, Ledgewood Farm um, writes, uh, she asked, will solar energy, this is related to um, AEC, will solar energy bids be for installing panels on roofs of buildings considered for replacement within the next five year facility plan? It's a really good question, um, which is, you know, uh, Mr. St. Ange, do you have an answer? Um my answer is that in our last um, town meeting, we voted as a town to make the roofs an option. And so when we receive bids, those companies have the option of including it. And so when we read them and decide what to accept, it, it may or may not include it. We just have to wait and see what is a part of each bid and what makes the most sense for the town at large. And also, um, you know, this will obviously be a, a, a concern that's raised if they're discussing that. I mean, you know, if, if, we, if we simultaneously have this new schools committee formed, um, you know, that's something that's relevant, I think, to that installation, that the installation of, or the potential installation of, uh, of solar panels on the on the buildings, uh, on the district buildings roof. So, um, but but a, a very relevant question. Thanks. That was a great answer, uh, Mrs. St. Orange. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anyone else? Any topics you, that we didn't foresee within 48 hours? I just can I just give a compliment? Sure. Um, I'm just so impressed with this. Everything is is ever changing, and I just think that you know, with conference season already upon us, I've just been so impressed with how well the teachers are dealing with conferencing and fitting it in and zooming, and it's just been. 
I mean, for my, for my family, a very smooth process. So I just think it's just another way that the teachers are showing their adaptability and their willingness to just make it work and still be in very close communication with us. And it's also impressive to see how well they know our kiddos after only a very few number of um, in-person days. So just well done teachers. Thank you for noting that. I'd say yeah. that if we didn't comment in my update on the virtual open house, um, that would a lot of work for our, our staff to create those. And we realize it's not as, uh, yeah, it's not as good as, a, as an open house where you're there walking to the building, but I think they all tried to make it special and personalized. And I, uh, from the ones I've seen, I've been very impressed. So just wanna shout out to the staff and thank you for noting that Lydia, very important. It is, that was a really nice point, Ms. St. Orange, thank you. Um, the teachers are working really hard and uh, seem to be uh, having a wonderful time doing it in the uh, in the in the recent walkthroughs that uh, that uh, several of us have made. Um, they seem to be engaging the students as much as possible. So thank you to all of them. All right. Anything else? OK, moving on executive session. There's no uh, reason that I know of to move into executive session at this time. Um, Unless someone else has a reason to, we're going to go to the next agenda item, which calls for a motion. Is there a motion on the floor to adjourn the October 21st, 2020 school committee meeting? So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Kaliri. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Kearney. All in favor, please indicate so in roll call vote. Alphabetical order, Mrs. Kaliri. Aye. Mr. Kearney. Aye. Mrs. Marr. Aye. Mrs. St. Ange. Aye. Hi, Craig McClellan. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Hey, everyone.